Welcome to the March 20th Special Board of Education meeting. Please silence your cell phones and then join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Secretary Hatfield, can you take a roll, please? Absolutely. Uh, President Rausch? Here. Vice President McFarland? Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Treasurer Lauterbach? Here. Member Blazy? Here. Member Ringgold? Here. Member Horowitz? Present. At this time, we'll move into agenda item number two, request to address the board, Mr. Bonadies. Greetings. While I appreciate President Rauch's statement at Monday's meeting that it was understood that the selection of a superintendent would take place at the end of this meeting, none of your documentation actually says that, not your timeline nor your agenda. I will acknowledge that the Midland Daily News did report it in the newspaper today. I fully acknowledge that the public has no standing at these meetings, and I do realize that you have been freed from Robert's Rules of Order and your bylaws will probably give you enough latitude to do this. But I would like to propose before the candidates present that somebody make a motion to add to the agenda item 3.2 for action regarding the actual selection of a superintendent, just so the minutes look like you did some of this in a rational sequence. I look forward to your discussions. Good luck. Would anybody else like to address the board at this time? Okay. So I did not, when I set the kind of tentative timing up with Sarah, no idea how much public comment we would get. So I had Dr. Reed coming at 6.15 and then Penny Miller Nelson coming at 7.30. So we've got a little bit of time before <laughs> Dr. Reed's scheduled to, to come in. Um, today, as we had emailed the candidates um, with, our, with our agenda for today, we had asked them to come with a presentation, which they have emailed to Sarah, um, targeting about 30 minutes on their visions for MPS, and then approximately 30 minutes for questions and answers. As a board, obviously, we don't at this point have any um, formalized questions for each candidate. I'm sure each of us have some particular questions that we would like to ask the candidates based on uh, based on our experiences with them so far, but after, after the interview, or excuse me, after the initial 30 minutes, um, I think it'll happen kind of organically, where it's more of a conversation and questions and answers, but just ask everybody, you know, make sure there's time for each board member to ask questions um, and not to dominate any conversation, but I don't think that would happen as it is. Any questions or further discussion? Um, along with what Mr. Bonnetty said, do we have a four action item that needs to be added on here or we, we're not taking any action? So if we're voting, that's an action item. So we are not a Roberts Rules of Order district, so mm -hmm. as soon as we make a motion that becomes an action item, I'm happy to add an action uh, for action tonight, but we've consistent with what we've discussed, but. Our, our agenda usually reflects anything that's. Oh, I don't think I don't think we need Okay. Do you? We, we can, it's not a big issue. Do you wanna make a motion, Brad? Sure, I make a motion for item 3.2, that we have an action item, that we will be having a board vote on these two candidates for our next superintendent of middle public schools. Support. Motion by Blazy. support by Lauterbach. Any dis further discussion? I'm not even sure if this is an action, but 
Any any opposition to adding the action item? Say aye. Okay. The motion is added. Any other questions about tonight's format or any concerns about process that we have in front of us? Okay. So take a 10 minute break and start at 615 with okay. Dr. Reed. All right. Well, If we're ready, it sounds like Dr. Reed is ready. Um, so we'll turn it over to you. Dr. Reed, we'll, um, just a reminder, about 30 minutes for the presentation and then engage in dialogue and Q&A. So. Okay, well, I'm gonna stand and sit. I'm gonna do a little hybrid here. So I just wanna thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Uh, had a good, a good time on my tours. Uh, learned a lot about the district. I got a chance to see a lot of different things that we're really proud of and that we should be proud of as a district. I'll just start off with uh, my tour itself. Uh, some of the things that I noticed, I, I did notice we have really great uh, principals in our district. They really are passionate about our goals and initiatives for our scholars. Uh, we had great staff. Uh, the schools and school community were really upbeat and up tempo about our resources that we have rich in Midland Public Schools. So I was really excited about that. I then got a chance to see the why, kind of behind the facility planning, got a better understanding of the population growth in some areas versus the decline in growth or stagnant growth in other areas. Got a chance to look at the upkeep of some of our school buildings. And I, I was reflective of how our scholars come to school and what they see on their way to, on their way to school. And that was very important to me. And I saw a desire from the scholars or the staff for the conversation to continue. It was fun to talk about education. It was an opportunity to plan for a future district and not to be comfortable that we had a room for improvement. Um, from the scholars to the staff or the community, um, I, I value the time to listen, truly listening to understand uh, and not to be understood was the goal for me. Um, I enjoyed the chocolate place, Heather and Holly. I think I bought everything there. She had to put me out. I enjoyed uh, the tour. I was riding in the big boy truck. I have a little bitty car, so I was in the big boy truck. It felt good. And he gives the best tours. He's a really good guy. I really uh, enjoyed my time uh, with him. So it was a exciting time for me. Uh, I enjoyed myself. So I, I took away things that I knew my skill sets can bring to Midland, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my next uh, slide. W one of the things that stood out to me was we have a lot of great things. We have a great culture, we have great academics, and we have the, the soil for great leadership within our school district. So my vision for Midland Public Schools is to make sure we will prepare our scholars for a global economy by equipping them with skills to successfully navigate a world of constant change and choice. I just wanna make sure that it's clear that we're in a world now of constant change and choice. And that especially happened post COVID. So I'm not gonna talk about the myriad of things that can be done because we have a lot of great things going on here. But I wanna focus on three key areas that I think everybody should take away about Midland Public Schools. The number one thing that I would quickly want our vision to entail is true diversity, equity, and inclusion work. That is number one. Making sure we have a pipeline to recruit and retain. And finally, a toolkit to prepare us for the future of education. Those would be my three focal points today. And I'll start off with the true diversity, equity, and inclusion work. It, it is something that's important to us. It's on our front page. It's, it's what we talk about and it's what we foundation ourselves on. So coming in the district, one of the things that's very important is to see where we really are. You can't rate yourself there. 
you want to do a, a inventory to see where you are as a board, as a superintendent, as a cabinet, as administrators, as staff. And I would want to take the idea out to just see where we land as a district here in Midland. Uh, depending on where you are, you meet yourself where you're at, and you train from there. It's like a scholar in the classroom. Uh, you don't come with every two. You find out where you're at, you're honest about that, and you move from there. The next step after we do a, an inventory on where we really are in our equity lens would, would definitely be able to look at what equity looks like in action. Too many times, equity is just a feel-good thing. That you can't measure. You really don't see. So people drift away from it. Equity for me, wherever I go, is things that I do with you and not for you. So the first part of equity is I'll just break it down for you in bags. We want to come into our district with bags of equity. And let's just start with the, be the be behaviors, right? The, the behavior part is the most pressing in schools and in districts. And I believe in order to make sure that we're resolving issues with behavior is you get what you're looking for. If you're looking to manage behaviors, that's what you're going to do. If you're looking to build scholar leadership, that's what you're going to do. We have to make sure that we show out and show up with our scholars. Because the inequity is being in that classroom with that teacher that is drowning because we have not addressed the issues in our class. So my mantra is we're going to show you we care, but we're going to hold you accountable. There's no room for inaccountability in our classroom, because at that point, you drown your teachers. Accountability has to be clear. Restorative practice does not work without accountability, because I can just keep restoring restorative, but if you don't hold me accountable, I keep going. So that is number one. Attendance. Attendance is not just showing up to the class, showing up to the building. That's the least. Attendance is engaging in the process. When we're, we're making these plans, our scholars have to be at the table. When we're making school improvement plans from fifth grade through 12, they are very innovative in their thinking, and they have to be a part of the process. This makes teaching fun, instruction fun, and our planning tables are more engaged and more versed. Next grades, from formatives to summatives, our whole scholar has to be assessed. Not just the test, but the social skills, the ability to apply to the world that we're facing. The inequity is to not know how our scholars learn. I think every scholar learns a different way, and I'll get to that a little bit here. But I want to make sure that's clear when we're grading. We have a very powerful system of instruction. We don't want to let that get down. But we do have an horizon coming. I want to make sure we're mindful of that. And social-emotional. If I want my principals to lead scholars in the building, I have to have a skill of coaching and supporting principals. Who's checking on that principal? Who's making sure their mental health is OK? From the principal down to the staff, to the cabinet, to the teachers, we have to take mental health serious. Because if you have a struggling teacher in the classroom and you can't recognize it, you can't support your building. If you have a struggling principal, that principal has to feel like he or she has a thought partner in everything he or she does. That is very important to me. A strong leadership gives you a pulse to bring back to the cabinet, back to our board. So the next part of this is just, I talked about it briefly, but I want you guys to realize something. Uh, some of you guys might watch the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl makes a lot, a lot of money. In 15 and 20 seconds, they know something we may not have realized. I can play you a commercial from when you were little, right? Or 10 years ago, and you're gonna remember that commercial. Why is that? Some of our scholars going to class that can't remember stuff from 10 seconds ago. It's because the way many scholars learn is not the way we teach. Many ways we learn is rhythmatic. If you learn the ABCs without a song, you was a little different. You had a rhythm to you, right? You said A, B, you sung a song with it. Rhythm goes away, and so do certain scholars at a certain grade level. I want you guys to think about that. So we got to make sure that we're prepared for how each scholar learns, no matter where they're coming from. Some scholars learn rhythmatically. Some scholars learn through story and origin. Some, some scholars, they won't learn anything until they put their hands on it. So we can continue to teach one way, and you'll see one type of success. But then we have to take equity out of our front page, because equity means each scholar can show up and show out. So one of the most important things to that, 
And one of the things I saw, I was a little worried about, is our pipeline for the future. Midland may not look the same down the road. Too many times I've met with superintendents and heard them say, this explosion just happened and we were not ready. So what we have to do is we cannot represent equity without a diverse style. We cannot say we're doing equity without equitable looking schools on both sides of town. We cannot say we're equitable until those things happen. We have to make sure every voice is at the table to say we're inclusive. So if we're going to say diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have to actually do it. Equity is not a feel good, it's not a catchphrase, it is an action that allows us to make the strong scholar stronger, move the middle, and the scholars that are coming in from anywhere can jump into our system and grow. I want to make sure just looking around when I saw the few scholars that were, uh, you know, scholars that were diverse and staff members I did not see, they need spaces, affinity spaces, spaces to get together, share best practice, be their authentic self. You're not going to recruit diversity without diversity. You can keep trying it if you want to. You got to make this place the number one destination in the Midwest and we have the ability to do that. This is something that we do in Rockford. Um, Brother Pope, he's on my team. He's a brilliant person. He's probably touring some uh, schools right now as, I, as I'm speaking here. But when we look at our state, we are the go-to in the Midwest. Every state across the Midwest has a touch point with us. Right now, we have 38 different teachers that are going to be in our pipeline that we got from various places that are very diverse. We have 100 candidates in varying stages getting licensures. And what, what that helps us is we have a great opportunity to do instruction a little different because we need to shrink that class size. We can't be in a class with half the population of diverse learners and think we can do intervention. So we got to hire a little different. Right there, we have a partnership with 19 universities. We just added, I think, Iowa uh, recently. Uh, our, HR, our HR cabinet member did. And we're making sure that we have touch points of scholars in our building. We have to grow our own if you want to prepare for the future. We have to have a conversation with juniors and seniors and get them excited about the possibility of being educators. Everybody else markets education the right way and we kind of do it the wrong way. It makes education look very boring. Education is exciting. It's the thing to do. It's what's happening. It's the culture. And we got to innovate that in our scholars at a younger age so we can grow our own pipeline. In the state of Illinois, our superintendent is probably the only time I'll say anything about Ohio. But he was watching something in Ohio State. They had a drab board projected for the next five years. I won't mention Ohio again. But he came back and he's like, hey, we got to get ready for the next five years. And he put it on our team. And we have a drab board where we know who's graduating college and who's coming to us. We have touch points ready to go. We have different languages because when the newcomers come into various areas, they speak various languages. So we got to be prepared for that. We can get comfortable or we can get prepared. The next thing for me is probably really important is that, you know, equity is the number one thing for us on our page. We got to make sure that our superintendent has a toolkit that is equitable. And I'm just going to be really clear about what that looks like. In my journey, I, I, I had to take every step. I had to be a coach. I had to be a parent, I had to be a teacher, I had to be a dean, I had to be an assistant principal, I had to be a principal, I had to work at the district, finally get to the cabinet, I worked my way up every part of that ladder. And when you do that, you understand facility planning first as a principal. You understand managing a budget as an assistant principal. You understand scheduling sets up intervention for you to be allowed in your class setting. You learn so much going up that ladder. And I probably would not be able to stand before you all had I not went up that ladder and not missed every step. In order to equitably take care of my team and our staff and our district, I got to know what it looks like at every step. I could not miss a step and be here before you all because I value this role. So I wanted to make sure coming here I had hit every step. I learned the most from being a principal of a large high school and an assistant principal making schedules and making sure I put interventions and things in place so it wasn't a part of something different, it was just a part of what we do. Because what you do when you do that is you get a lot of scholars labeled diverse learners. No, we just need to learn diversely how to teach each scholar. 
So that was something I prided myself on, uh, you know, as a principal. So as I went up that ladder. And then the next thing for me, uh, you know, I'll just quickly talk about, you know, my last 21 years really quickly. I, I, I've had a chance to work with some powerful people. And I don't take that for granted. And I know what scares people may be, oh, he's been in a lot of places, but I picked up a lot of tools. If you're a ball player, you do something, you pick up a lot of tools. You're just a two-kitted person that can be in any space and navigate it. You know how to enter at a subtle space. You know how to enter if you have to be aggressive. You've learned a lot to do a lot. And that has been my background. I am fortunate currently uh, you know, to work in a cabinet, and, and we challenge ourselves. And the conversations are tough. But I truly value them, because all this experience, and, and we sharpen each other. I won't say their names. I, I promise I won't. But I, uh, we give them nicknames in our district based on some things that their, their, their teams gave them nicknames. So I'll just say that. So our, our school's team, just learning about the innovative way to, to coach and support your principal. Our HR person, like I talked about earlier, he is innovative uh, in the way he does things for our district to make sure that we are sound and prepared and organized. Our communication and marketing is it's on another level because we want to make sure all the Midwest sees and hears from us. Our facilities planning, we're building different departments, K through eight, some of the things that you guys are talking about, we're doing it. Our CTE new plan from our, our facilities person. And uh, I'm gonna be honest with you, the way you treat bus drivers gotta be like Deion Sanders. They need gold chains and they need everything. We hyping them up to wanna be there. We gotta outcompete everybody for those bus drivers. They are part of our planning and process. They feel good to work for RPS. They come from everywhere to work for us. We pay them right, we treat them right, we incentivize scholars on the bus for acting the right way. They are a part of our staff. From the custodial work on down, that is what we learn from our communications, our curriculum teams, and our technology team, that we have to be safe. And safety is not just something you do in the school, it's something you do cyber-wise. We have artificial intelligence, various things that are happening before our eyes that we have to prepare for. And I think most importantly, my superintendent, he just gives me a, a space to be me. And he never tells me to shut down from being the best self because he knows my goal. And I call him a, a baby Belichick because he has a lot of superintendents, a lot of people under him. So from the first person that gave me the opportunity to be assistant principal, all the way down to my current superintendent, I just had to be thankful for the, every step of the ladder because I saw every type of scholar. I saw the scholar that was enthusiastic about coming to school every day. I saw the scholar during COVID that would not get out the bed. And if you saw what I did in South Bend, I went and put desks in all they house and made them get out their bed and get at that desk. I am going to do whatever it takes as a superintendent to make sure each scholar, not all, thrives in our district. And they're not just prepared for today, they're prepared for the future. My last slide, because you give me the microphone, I'll talk all day. So I wanted to make sure I shorten my slides here. I just want you guys to look at that and just tell me what it is. If you see it, you should probably know what it is. That is a basketball arena, right? Now, I don't know if Central State made it to the tournament. Unfortunately, I did not research that. I don't know which Michigan teams made it. I should have known that. Didn't get a chance. I know, I know Michigan fired the coach. I know that. So I did not check my research on who got in the tournament. So I apologize for that. But look at that basketball stadium. I want you to imagine that basketball stadium is education. Education back in the day was built on a lot of legislation with no transformation. And I'm going to tell you what happens when you do that. So if you look at that basketball stadium, and that's education, imagine this. Soccer has to play there. Swimmers have to swim there. Football has to play there. Volleyball has to play there. Baseball has to play in this stadium. That's education. So now what's going to happen to those scholars playing in this arena? Two things. They're going to have to scaffold their ability. They're going to get a label. Or they're going to leave the stadium. And that's what we see across America. If a football player is playing on that court, well, he's going to trip. He can't run a full route. I can't hit a home run. I cannot play to my capabilities and capacity at the current stadium that we built for education. So what we have to do is look at the stadium and make sure that it's for each you got to open that up. you got to let the football player be the football player because the only player that can play in that stadium is a basketball player. And maybe volleyball will assimilate because it naturally fits that, but many will not be able to play to their full potential 
in that stadium. No matter how hard I can hit that ball, you'll never know it. No matter how good I am at being a football player, you won't know it. Because the stadium has limited my ability to be my best self. So I come before you all to let you know that I bring a wealth of experience. I know how to open the stadium up for each. And I know I may look not like the norm, but I've been everywhere and I've become normal because I'm a part of what you do and what you care about. I have children as well. I have to thank my wife. She always tell me, go, go, go. And she don't mind me going and she pushes me. My children are innovative. They can come in a room and adapt. And I really appreciate them for giving me that opportunity. Once that's checked off, nothing else matters because I can go and do what I have to do as a superintendent to lead the district. So uh, that's my presentation. Made it short for you all. Thank you all for listening. Uh, you guys can ask me any questions from here. Thanks, Dr. Reed. Um, appreciate you bringing the presentation and, and sharing your vision of the district. Um, we'll probably jump around from each of us and have more of a conversation than anything. No problem. Um, can you help us to understand when we when I look at the district that you're currently in, mm -hmm. it's a much larger district. The executive mm -hmm. team is much larger than what we have. Mm -hmm. So in your current role, what are your accountabilities and responsibilities specifically? What is your purview of your team today? You're asking what do I? What are you accountable and responsible for in your current role in your district? Pretty much everything, because the way our district is set up, everything comes through our equity department. So if you're talking about facilities and planning, that we are part of the process. So anything that's vetted, whether it's policies, practice, that comes through my department. So where one cabinet member may sit on a specific, I have to transcend through multiple departments because our equity lens. So I get an opportunity to work operations, facilities, curriculum. So that's what I talked about that cabinet earlier because I work directly with these individuals that are very brilliant, brilliant in what they do. And that is my preview. My uh, superintendent we just met yesterday, he, he said, man, you, you, you like a mini superintendent, he just lets me go. And I do what I have to do to make sure each department is has the lens of equity. Okay. So maybe a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you are if your district is working through the budget process, I yep. take it your CFO is leading that, and then you're, look, you're participating and providing the equity lens? Yeah, so we bring it to cabinet usually and make sure we discuss it on Mondays. Then we scale out who needs to be there, and usually what happens, and I think that was our conversation yesterday, I'm usually in the room for most things because you want to make sure everything has an equitable lens. So whether I stay through the process depends on where the process and how I feel we're doing it. A lot of times we get our input up front, and we make sure that lens is up front. My team is uh, vetting and looking at things. Our board policies, we have to review those all. So it's, it's about making sure that I'm a part of that process, seeing it through. For, if it's something like facilities planning, for example, we're building uh, a master's facility plan. We have a listening session going out, making sure that's done correctly. We're looking at how that facility is going to be done equitable. And we're making sure that we're looking at the funding that we're going to put in there. Uh, for example, I, I, I know my superintendent has talked a lot about making sure we're balanced in what we have on both sides of town. So that is where we show up. It's probably kind of hard to see, but it's not a department that I don't have to intertwine in. I have to be embedded in um, what we do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's accepted. It's because it's needed for our district because we really want to do the equity work the right way. So in, is it fair to say that in a lot of cases – a specific cabinet member is putting together a rough draft and then you're at the table reviewing it? It depends. It, the rough draft can come from me. We can be the ones organizing it up front. Uh, for example, the, a lot of sometimes the curriculum movement, it comes up front from my team or myself. Uh, sometimes the, the looking at you know the possibilities, they can come from my team up front. And we trust that cabinet member to run that out because we have that equity lens. I think the good thing about our cabinet now is they're very equitable on what we do. So whether we're bringing an idea, we're bringing a, a suggestion, a solution, uh, it's going to come through that, uh, that department. It's going to come through everybody's lens of how they think, though, now. I think that was the most important thing for me, is to make sure everybody thinks about everything in their department in an equitable way. And you know, some, many times the conversations are not easy conversations, but mm -hmm. we have to get to where we have to go. OK, thanks. So just to be clear, when when you're uh, when you're examining different proposals, mm -hmm. 
you're viewing them through the equity lens. Correct. Are you ultimately responsible for how they fit financially in the district? Absolutely. That that is probably the most important thing. Uh, you know, to look at our finances. If you're looking at a grant, we we are for some grants are not for us as a district. We just got a grant yesterday, and the grant was almost two million. But it would take away a, a, a curriculum that we already have in place. So we have to vet that out, and you have to work with the content expert. But you absolutely, the funding and the spending is probably the most important part of it. Operation management is the most important part because you want to make sure you're equitable in everything you do, and we have to keep up with that as a team. We have some schools in some tougher areas, and those that need more, we have to make sure they get more. But then the flip side, we have some of the top schools in the state. You don't want to take away some of their tools that they have. If they need an extra pair, you have to make sure they have it. So it's really looking at every point in that district with a fine tune because I remember one of our top schools, uh, you know, felt they needed a pair because you know, they had some new scholars coming in. That's probably one of the top ranked schools in that state. And we had to make sure that we looked at that through an equitable lens and are looking at our gifted academies and programs in that way. So yes. I have a, <clears throat> it's maybe a weird question, Dr. Reed. What exactly is your title? Uh, because I found three different titles for you and I'm not sure which one. And I know we had some uh, questions from the community. Um, Deputy Chief of Equity, mm -hmm. that information I got from your Ann Arbor interview. Uh, mm -hmm. Deputy Chief of Schools, that was on the resume that you provided to us. Mm -hmm. And then Chief DEI Officer, that's on the Rockford Public Schools yeah. website. So those, the, the last two roles, the equity roles are both the same. There's points in the, in the year where we're definitely supporting our principals, but my title is the Diversity Chief of Equity. So that, how you say it doesn't matter, the two you said are the same role. Uh, the chief of equity. We have a cabinet, and my title is the, is equity. I'm the chief of equity. So that's the role I, I stay on. The other roles probably would not fit me. They were probably things I did, I did at certain points. But you know, just working with my superintendent, the overall role for me is the equity role because it allows me to be a little more like water and be in multiple spaces. I think if you saw a role earlier, it was because I was focused on a certain area. But now that is the role that he has set for me because it gives me the flexibility to do what he needs me to do. Okay. I have a question. <clears throat> Thanks for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, what would your first 60, 90, 120 days look like if you were offered the job? Well, I think we talked about it uh, fairly uh, robust in that first 30 to 60 to 90 days. You have to listen better to understand. But we have some high level things that are going on quickly when you're looking at facilities. Because I did see some areas that you know, I, I would say I would not want my scholar walking up to that, right? And so we quickly have to look at where we're going with population and, and you know, growth in some areas versus the other. But I definitely would think that first 30 days, we will make sure we're doing a listening session, getting that cadence set up to respond, getting the scholar's voice in some of the spaces that we already have existing. It's not a lot of heavy things you want to do in those first 30, 60, 90 as a superintendent. It, it functions a lot different in a superintendent role from the principal. But it's building that relationship. You have a cabinet you have to get a relationship with. You have a board you have to get a relationship. You have stakeholders you have to figure out. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know who, where your bonds are coming from. You have to figure out different policies and things that are in place. You've got to fine tune that stuff. It's a lot of direct work in the superintendent role you've got to do in those first 30, 60, 90 days before you can take off. So I think a lot of that is making sure that we're looking at what we have in place, making the subtle pushes in, into our curriculum aspirations with our principal, and empowering that principal to do he or she's job. But I think uh, that role is going to require a lot of hybrid listening and learning our various stakeholders. I don't, you know, I have to know my board's goals in order to play them out. I have to know where our principles, our strengths and weaknesses in order to support them. So it's a lot of, a, a lot of learning and cadence that you do. I will say, though, just having the ability to be a principal for a long time gives me a, a very good power to, to support the principal. That's the area that I probably were least worried about, had good connection with the principals. Uh, but just to listen to our stakeholders and learning where we fit and what our goals are. We will have to realign equity, though. That would be something within the first 30 to 60, 90 days we have to look at. And we have to be intentional about that because we cannot, in the you know, space we are, uh, truly value the equity work without you know, looking at some changes, looking at some pipelines, and looking at diversity in our district. So I'm going to jump in with a follow-up because you mentioned cabinet. Um, in the Midland Daily News, I read your Q&A with Ben, 
um, and you, you talked about building a cabinet. I want to make sure we understand what you mean by that because I think, I think it caught people off guard in this building and that's okay, but I want to make sure that we understand what you mean. So what are your, I want to make sure we understand your comment about building out a cabinet. What are your thoughts um, on how this process would go? You said I made that comment where? In the Midland Daily News and the questions and answers. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that conversation. He was talking to me on the road while I'm driving home. I don't where I'm okay. from a bit, so I'm not familiar. But a cabinet is what you all already have. I met with your facilities person. I met with your equity person. Yep. I met with your curriculum person. So working with our cabinet is that what that essentially means. You already have that set up. Had a good conversation with your transportation guy. Those are people that are a part of our cabinet. So what I mean by that is making sure I'm meeting with the stakeholders that impact our scholars on a daily basis. I kind of did that when I walked around on the tour. That is, it's just different terminologies, I guess, for different spaces, okay. but that is what we call a cabinet. Okay. Uh, Dr. Reed, just to follow up a little bit on the facility stuff, uh, mm -hmm. what personal experience and knowledge do you have regarding passing millages, school building, and site improvement bonding, mm -hmm. and oversight of school maintenance and construction? Yeah, I've had a, a robust experience with that. Uh, in particular, before I got to Rockford, we were in the process of those two. I talked about that in my last interview. Where we were combining schools and we were looking at mills. You all have a different process, though. So if we do, we're going to compare apples to apples, we've got to be sure we're doing that. You all process for mills are a little different. I think you all need seven different, before you go, different approval processes. A lot of things you all do a little different than our state, but they, they, they transfer the same. We worked on bonds. We, we, we have a similar approval process. In Illinois, there are certain things that we're renewing or upgrading. We don't have to get approval for. We go to the board. We're here. That may be a little different. So it is learning from state to state the difference in, in, in those two uh, entities. But I've had experience in Wisconsin doing it. Illinois has some the same hiccups, some differences in how they are processed, how you get bonds, how they get approved. Uh, you, you all have to have a certain number before you can go a certain amount of, you know, bonds. And so it's just looking at how you all defer from the other two states that I've worked at doing that work. We went to Milwaukee and went to Alice West Milwaukee Central High and talked to the staff there. Mm -hmm. What would they say about you and what would they say about why you left? Well, the staff would ultimately say that we, we had a family atmosphere. If you were to talk to my chief at that time, when she walked in my building, she brought an external person and she said that he's just a rock star. It was not an atmosphere of a principal. Those are my teammates. And I don't function in a title. I function in the role of serving my community. So you were walking that school, and the year before, we had a lot of fights. A lot of fights. That next year, we, I'm talking about double digits, 90s and 100s and type of fights. We went down to single digits because we built an atmosphere of expectations. We too many times run in and, and, and set rules. We sat down with our scholars, built out expectations, made sure that we put scholars in position to run different parts of our schools and let them take off. We did not have that, that type of fight, and our staff would say they were very supportive. I, I checked on their mental health. I made sure we had a team always pulsing them. We had what we call tag out. You, you're not going to be your best every day. Tag you out. Tag your principal out. It was days that we supported other principals, and, and we just had an understanding that we're a community, and people did not want to leave. If you were to go there now, that was the, the most hurtful thing is, you know, them knowing that I was on a trajectory and I wanted to be somewhere because they wanted to combine the schools and for me to take over both schools. That, that just was not what I wanted. But they would tell you it was very hurtful because that was the atmosphere. But what I did is built them and set them up for success. I made sure the, uh, the assistant principal that was working for me had those various tools. He continued those cadences. We made sure that we continued a lot of things that we built up at, at that place. But it, it wouldn't, they would not talk to you in the function of he was just our principal in some office. I don't think I ever saw my office. I think I was in the classroom, in the hallway, I was engaged. You couldn't even, my, my superintendent would kind of know, you're going to meet with Dr. Reed at a certain time, but he's engaged and infused in that building. And that's what you want. You want to see your work get down to the scholar. You can't say that the diverse learner is a you know, special ed student and you don't know what he or she's abilities are and why they're in the hall and why they need these very support because our, our diverse learners, you have to make sure you partner with them and their families. So I, I think the other thing they would say, we have a great partnership with families. Our families showed up for everything. 
because it was a family atmosphere. And, and I kind of feel that here, that we have the capabilities to make spaces family oriented. Community building uh, has to be at the forefront of what we do. But I, I'll just repeat, uh, you know, just the title did not matter to me. It's the responsibility that you have to the community you serve. Kind of a, a similar question. I'm interested if we went and spoke to the union president of Rockford Public Schools, what would that individual say about your relationship with the union? That would be a good conversation now, I'll tell you what. Um, the union conversations are always uh, unique. We are, we had a new uh, union representative and may not have always been rocky. It may not have been the best. A little rocky to start off, right? But we had a session with her teachers because I wanted to make sure she understood that the teachers should not just have the union to represent them. They should have the, the team. We should represent them as well. So we had a meeting with them and I had to build a relationship with her. And I had to learn how she worked. So if you called her now, uh, she may struggle with many people, but we're in a good place. She wanted her name on stuff. She wanted to come from her. I don't care who it came from. You can drop it off a helicopter as long as it gets done for my scholars. She's in a good place. I had to learn how she operated, though. I had, I, I, she was new, and, and, and sometimes in spaces, it wasn't what we were used to. But learning her was important to me. I, I don't see things as a challenge. I love it as an opportunity. So the opportunity to build that relationship with her is very important. If you were to call her today, ask her doctor, about Dr. Reed, she would tell you we probably had some tough conversations. I can't give up everything. We, ha we, we have a, a onus to our scholars. But she'll tell you we respect each other and we have a path forward and we can call each other and text each other. Now, at first, you know, that might not have been the case with us because of some, some, some trust issues that we may have had. But I think we're in a good place where we can do the right thing together and move forward for the scholar. Get everything, get your emotion out the way. Our scholars are at the forefront of what we're thinking about now. I've got another one for you, Dr. Reed. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about your personal experience in human resource and labor law, and do you have any personal experience negotiating collective bargaining agreements? Yes. Uh, we're, we're, we've been in the middle of a couple of those uh, right now, uh, our minutes and our, 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 our uses of certain things. We, had a, we took our ESSER funds an extended day, and that was one of our bigger bargaining agreements now that we're going away from that extended day. How do we maximize those minutes within the union policies? So we've negotiated that, and I think that is the one that we're in right now. We've had past negotiations where we've dealt with uh, the professional development piece. That's probably the bigger one that we have recently. But I, I've worked directly with uh, our HR person on those. That is the one that, you know, we have to be on the same page because you can try to use equity. As to, that, that's where you try to use equity. It isn't inequitable. But I think he has a steady hand in what we do there. And I think we, are, are, we have some great negotiations coming up for next year. We're, we're building out our new CTE center. We're looking at one of the other things we're looking at is how we negotiate the start of the day. I think that's going to be a big one for us as well. Because what, what happens in our district is uh, the different start times, it's kind of hurting our attendance. And the union is going to, we're going to, we're going to, you know, I don't want to give up everything, but that's going to be a struggle that we got to fight uh, for next year because we're going to change those start times. So we've had experience uh, doing that in my department. I did tell you, uh, Brother McFarland, the, all the policies kind of go through our team. We review policies to help make those practices go off the ground on the front end. And our board president has us kind of reviewing all the policies that were dated to a certain time. So a lot of the HR practices of uh, dealing with things and, and the buildings, we, we have to go and review those all over again. So it's put me in a, a more frenzy of an understanding of how various policies are leading to various HR initiatives that we are rolling out. So I would say that's a, something that we're doing anew right now because she's, she put a date that she wanted us to review every policy that was not completed before a certain date. So she felt they were outdated. So does that mean that there is a team of HR personnel that are actively negotiating bargaining agreements and you kind of have oversight through an equity lens or are you actively participating? It, it depends. It depends on the situation. It depends on... Because uh, I'm just trying to figure out your personal experience yeah. in what you've done. 
Yeah, for, for HR purposes, that, that, that depends on the situation. Our bargaining as it relates to getting new staff and staffing, that is something that directly I would deal with. If it's bargaining as it relates to the minutes or something, that is definitely a team. We have a large district, so you're not going to be in every part of that, but we have a team that definitely works on that. But I've worked on that with various teams as it needed from my lens. I'm definitely going to work on that, Brother McFarland, from the lens of equity as it comes to that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Two-part question. Mm -hmm. First part is there's a there's a gap in your resume um, that you turned into us from 17 to 19. So it goes from Oglesby Elementary School to Joslin School. Was there a, another role in there? No, you it should not. You said a gap from where? So it goes 2014 to 2017 mm -hmm. assistant assistant principal, and then 2019 to 2020 assistant principal at Joslin School. So there's a there's a gap missing from 17 to 19. It should, it should be no gap. So it was at Cerro is on my resume. Okay. On LinkedIn. I don't know yeah, which. It's, it's not on there. Yeah. I don't know which resume you have because I sent them the uh, resume. So I don't. Well, it's, yeah, it's the one through the, the HYA portal. Yeah. So he has two different one of my resumes, I noticed. So okay. a Cerro should be on there. OK. A CERO and the other school were two charter partners. I guess that's what that might not have been a several partner perspectives and a, a CERO or two partner charters. So when you were working at one charter, they uh, kind of had the opening for the principal role in the other, and that's perspective. A CERO was a charter that you probably are not seeing on there. I'm, Correct. If you have a, okay. a resume, yeah. They are partner charters, though. CERO partners with perspective. It was the same uh, organization of people that were working uh, during that time. So I think I moved from the CERO in the assistant principal role straight into the, the principal role for a, uh, perspectives, Jocelyn. Okay. Okay, because it says assistant principal at Jocelyn. Okay. Got it. So my, the second part of that question is, that means six roles in 10 years. So you've, you've, you addressed some of it in your mm -hmm. presentation, yeah. and I appreciate that. My, the, the other question to the six roles in 10 years is how have you measured success and failures of the changes that you've implemented over a longer period of time? Yeah, so the, if you look at a longer period of time, you have to look at Harper. I, I talk about at Harper where the data shows. Uh, I, I would not take my moving up as a knot because I moved up in every position and I did every position. So if, you, if we're gonna go at that, I wanna make sure it's clear that every position was an upward move. Mm -hmm. I moved from a charter school to taking on the charter school and I got to partner with something. I would move from there to doing a turnaround as a principal of a, of a community and that was neat. You definitely measure success by, clearly by the data. You can look at any school coming into it, where our data is and where it's gonna go when I'm leaving there is on an uptick. Uh, if I'm moving somewhere, it's an upward projector. Now the empowerment zone in South Bend that was to come in and just do the turnaround work for the South Bend. We knew that coming into place. Uh, so coming into the South Bend was, I, I knew that, hey, we had the empowerment zone. It was during COVID. I wanted that opportunity to work with those schools to do turnaround. Uh, we had Dr. Kamaja. She was brilliant. She came from Harvard. And she just built the team that she wanted to help turn around that system there. So, but those are all upper moves. Going from there, I knew that wasn't going to last, so I wanted to be at the high school. And I think I was up front in my attention. When I'm not coming in the door to tell you, hey, I'm not going to, I want to be a superintendent. I knew that coming out of Harper. Now, if you want to look at data at Harper, you, you're going to see a consistent cadence of data. You're going to see us improve behavior management. You're going to see us improve attendance. I was there 10 years. I, I, I wasn't planning on sitting places that, that I didn't have a chance to move up to. I finally became where I wanted to be. So how, I guess my question is more about longitudinal data. Mm -hmm. How have you measured success over the longer period of time as, you know, administrative level mm -hmm. changes in decision making is a lot different than a building. So how have, how have you measured the changes that you've made well um, in some of these other roles? I guess Since your question, Harper, question is not clear, but uh, you, you're saying how have I measured success inside of a building or, or long term? The, or at the district level. Yeah. So as a district level or the building, I'm going to measure success the same. I'm going to measure success by our scores. And I talked about if you're looking at our district now, in that lens, we have clear measurables. We want to improve behavior management. That's where we go out the back. We want to improve attendance. We want to improve grades. And we want to make sure the social emotional needs and scores are there. Our bags has kind of been the cadence that we've used. We have panorama like 
many districts. So I'm definitely, you're going to see a clear understanding of that. That, that is how we're going to move wherever I'm at. We're going to make sure you're not having suspension rates. You're going to see that there's a curve in that right off the bat. You're going to see attendance go up. You're going to see our scores and grades go up. Uh, those are the things that I'm going to clearly measure anywhere I've been. If you were to reference me, they're going to tell you those data points always are going to go up. And our current role at the district level is more of looking at that from the outside, from the balcony, and making sure that we have systems to support the longevity of those roles. So we definitely came in, and we have some glaring things that we have to fix. Now you're looking at it using those same cadence, but improving graduation rates and making sure that our, our graduation rates are on par with the state and making sure that we're looking at our SAT scores and getting every scholar an opportunity. So the same work I did as a principal, you just take it at the district and you look out and you lens out and you focus down. But it's not a school or a district you're going to go in and you're going to call and reference me to see that those data points are not moving in the right trajectory. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask a pretty pointed question here. Mm -hmm. How do we know that once you achieve superintendent, say at Midland Public Schools, you're not going to leave in three years for a significantly larger district. You would have to reference people that have always interviewed me from day one. I, I told you all, Harper was my, my baby. It was like the thing that I broke. And, I, and, and Harper was where I went to school. When you're on a goal, you're going to, you've got to see it from my standpoint. I had a goal to get to a place, and that was my goal. And, and I don't know if you knock that goal in any other profession, but education maybe. But I knew I wanted to be a superintendent. I'm not going to move my family around once I'm in that role. My wife has trusted me, supported me, had my back because she knew where I wanted to go. Once, when I'm a superintendent, I have a baby that I have to graduate through a system. And that is my goal. And she's nothing but three. So I got a long time to work and operate. I don't want to move my babies around. My, my scholars are resilient at home, but that's not something I want. But they've supported me because coming from where I'm coming from, you don't get these opportunities. I don't get the homie hookup. I got to work hard. So I am on my way to the top, and that was my goal, and I was not going to stop till I got there. So whatever that looked like, I made sure everywhere that you left, you're going to call, they're going to say, I wish you would have stayed. I did my job. I did it the best that it can be done, and I set it up for success for the future. My job was to become a superintendent. That was my call, and that's what I wanted to do. And when I become a superintendent, that's when my babies are going to graduate. And that has been my goal since I left Harper High School. Can I follow, I want to follow up on that, uh, maybe with a di little different question. So Midland and Ann, and Ann Arbor are markedly different communities, right? Absolutely. We know you're a finalist in each district. Uh, which one do you prefer and who's plan B? I don't know that I'm a finalist in any district. Uh, you're a semi-finalist in Ann Arbor. Right, so I, don't, I can't speak to Ann Arbor. I've interviewed with Midland. Ann Arbor was something that came up with the, with the agency because there's multiple roles you can apply for in Michigan. But this was the first place I applied to. This is what we've been focusing on. I've not even thought about anything different yet. This is the only thing my family knows. I've drove up here 12 different hours, three different times. So I'm not uh, fit to talk about it. This 36 hours I spent on a road focused on Midland. So I've been clear about where everything is, uh, what's going on here. I've not thought about anything else. Now, I absolutely, uh, uh, you know, I'm in a superintendent, you know, completing the program. You're, you know, when you're out there, you do application, but this has been our focus for my family uh, right now, uh, what it looks like here. Uh, this has been my opportunity. I put a lot of understanding to what this place looks like. And you guys are doing some things that I like here, so I can't speak to any other place, but uh, the 36 hours I've put coming here, I've not been to no other place uh, for 10 minutes. I've been here uh, consistently driving back here uh, for a reason. I'm sorry, have you interviewed in Ann Arbor? You yeah, they did a, uh, we had a virtual call, I want to say, a week ago. Okay. A weekend, yeah, that was a virtual. I didn't have to drive, though. Okay. They called me I on the screen. See. All right. Absolutely. I drive here. All right. All right. So what would you say we need to do better? You have to do equity the, right, the real way. And you have to be diverse. To walk into school and see no staff, if, if you don't have the right person, you're not going to draw the right people. I'm going to just say that clearer to you. Uh, you know, I have partnerships with across multiple schools and districts, and I have a lot of tools for that. But what, what hurts me is using equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and not doing it. It's action. You have to have action for that. You have to have measurables for that. You have to show that that's what the, are the scholars at the table at the planning. 
that the scholars felt like they belong. We have some brilliant scholars walking in there listening to them. They need to be at the table for this process. We're going to have to do some changes facility-wise. That, that, that's, that's clear and evident. Walking in some of those spaces, I can see why, you know, one of the middle schools, you know, how a scholar may feel. And then I would go and look somewhere. That's, that's all through the equity lens. I think the most important thing that my current superintendent does is allow everything to go through that lens. If you do everything through an equity lens, you do everything for each, and you do it the right way, and you take your time, and you build a foundation for it. Just even just looking at the facilities that we have, we, we, we have to look at everything through that equity lens. Because it's, 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 a, it's a group of scholars that have come in, and whether they're the working class or the corporate class, they see and recognize what we do. And you all are in a powerful position to make you know, the move to have a person. You can't have a person that you have to think if they know. You have to have a person that you know that they've had skills and done various things. So uh, being in a big district like Chicago Public Schools, going to a place like Milwaukee, I couldn't have been in these places and not navigated understanding. I would have drowned in one of those places. Th that's not what I did. So I definitely would tell you, coming in this place, we have to do the equity work and everything through an equity lens. That does not change a lot of the things that we have going great. But we got to check our belief and what do we really believe in and, and what are we doing for our future uh, here in Midland. I think we have a great opportunity here to set us up for what we're going to do in the future. You all didn't have uh, artificial intelligence thinking right before COVID, right? Now these scholars are doing all kind of papers, rap songs, music videos. You don't even know if they them or not. We better be prepared for that. Safety has to look totally different than safety has looked four or five years ago. Having the skill set and working with so many powerful cabinet members and staff to looking at safety and these things, there are things we got to be prepared for. Uh, you know, uh, you know, system attacks and all these various things that are going on post COVID. It has changed education. You have to be more hybrid and flexible. And I think the, the good thing about, you know, my opportunity, I would say, is doing it through an equity lens. I, everything I do will come through that lens. What safety measures have you implemented at Rockford? As it relates to, give me something specific. Uh, well, one of the things. Physical uh, safety. Physical safety is definitely, we have a new system in our district. Uh, it was a tough fight because of perception, having security systems in schools. We have them in our schools. And I remember when I first got there, I said, hey, look, our top schools in Chicago had these systems in place. We have to have these systems in place. So we, this, last year, we started to implement it. Um, the, the guy talked about, our, our, our guy that deals with that, we got it in our system. We had some great conversations up front. We did some great things. But that was something that was glaring, that our high schools did not have certain uh, security measures. And it was more of the perception of a certain size of town, the perception of having that in the school was not right, and we had to play the understanding game. And we had to do what's right for scholars. You know, a lot of times in education, the plan politics time, it has to go out the door when it comes time to do what's right for the scholar. And we did what's right for the scholar. We have a system in place. We're looking at that second system, but I'm not sure about it, the one with the vaping. Uh, you all have it in one of the two of the schools. You have to have a backup system to that, though. You have to have the system that lets you know when the scholar is leaving the classroom to go to bathrooms or that one is not as effective because you don't know. You can't track who went in and out. So that's why we can. Well, you, you got to know who goes to your bathroom. So if you, if, I, if you send somebody, if everybody sends somebody out into the hallway, you got to know who went in at what time. So the system they have in some districts now that we have in Wisconsin, it tracks who goes out the bathroom. You have to log out. It'll tell you how many people are in that bathroom and it'll read you and say, hey, these two scholars shouldn't be in the bathroom at the same time. That was a new robust system that I just saw. And that is why we didn't flush out that second part of that system, because I wanted to get more study on that system uh, and how that works up and, and looking at how that can help curb some of the things that happen in our bathroom. Because, you know, back in my day, whatever they were doing, you can smell it. Now you don't know what's going on in there. I, I remember as a principal, somebody had to warn me, don't buy the candy from the kids. It was, I didn't know what was going on. I was very naive. So I don't buy candy or anything from the kids. I thought the kids were happy. But I got to the bottom of that one, and we curved that one as well. So you've talked about the Central Michigan University basketball stadium there. Absolutely. Um, and how that does not apply to all sports, and the analogy is that it doesn't apply to all of our scholars. They learn differently. We need to have them see themselves in the curriculum. Absolutely. So obviously by you walking around and you know that we are looking at various different upgrades 
we don't know exactly sure what we're going to do if we're going to build another elementary yeah. if we're going to build another middle school or mm -hmm. if we're going to build one high school and bring them together we don't know but through your lens you stated that we didn't know that children could evolve as much as they did during COVID and how they learned mm -hmm. and does the brick and mortar look different in the new school that if you had a blank canvas how does that new school look through an equitable lens yeah that's a great question um just walking through our schools was really invigorating i got to go down to the brother in the classroom that was doing welding and looking at his tools and things and he was just explaining how you can get good jobs and things of like that what it looks like is keeping all the doors open in our schools many times a scholar graduates and the opportunity is pushed to them we need to have all doors open in our our new spaces whether that's military whether that's career whether that's college whether that's just going to work we have to be authentic about keeping the doors open and finding out where our scholars are early i also would say in our new facilities and what we do we have to make sure that we look at what happens when you close down spaces i think the thing that costs you the most money is when you close down a space and how you utilize that space that is closed down being innovative there can actually help us save money because if you look at a 10-year projection running schools that are closed down in chicago was drowning them you have to shut some of those spaces down use them innovative and that's a scary conversation but what we have we can't sustain you can't sustain when you have a population growth happening in one area and you have a stagnant growth in another that's going to decline if you keep going it that way we're going to keep losing money every three to five years our projection of money we're going to lose money that's a tough conversation you got to do it with the community the one high school thing the location is very critical to us because where you put it symbolizes something and, and, and you know i i don't want to go into details about that but it's a lot of tougher conversation we have to have but our new innovative school has to include the way our scholars learn and technology is allowing that where education like i said at the beginning is global they are not just looking at scholars right here in midland they know what scholars are doing they can tell you what scholars are doing in japan tokyo down to texas they can tell you everything about it we are downplaying how innovative our scholars minds became during that time they sat in front of those screens most of them could build out a video game and they don't even know it they are very innovative in their thinking and we have to address that through our innovative moves in our next building we have to put innovation at the forefront for the global economy that we're going to face in the future i think it's a great opportunity for it. i think you know people were using the ESSER funds to set ourselves up to do various things but just looking at some places without tracks without sports it, how do we know if a scholar can really attain these these attributes that is one of the things our facility managers plan is doing right now we're making sure that we we don't have we have some great athletes but we don't have great tracks and we're getting a track in one of our spaces we're knowing that this space is going to sustain this amount of time you have to know that as a superintendent how long is this space going to last where is it going to be in 10 years what is going on here we just got air conditioning in all our buildings that's beautiful so now we put air conditioning in we got to be caught and we just spent money so a lot of the things that have already happened are included in that cost when you're looking at our regain or we losing our money down at 10-year projection but i think the most important thing is what we do um, with our innovation in the classroom and how we utilize those spaces once these changes are inevitable begin to in some way happen so i'd like to ask a question to kind of build off of that um, a little bit you mentioned you have a three-year-old right we've talked a lot about technology and facilities and what they look like for career opportunities yep. for our older students what about our younger students what about our students who are still learning to read what about our elementary schools and what does that look like in a world with ai chat gtp yep. technology um, with a generation that has had a phone or an ipad since birth well it looks very innovative but it, we have to balance it I think the key part of that is the balance. You can't put them on the Chromebook all day. You can't put them on the computer all day. You have to have a balanced process with that. You, I, I liked it, the model where I saw where it was blended. Because what happens if you only chat GTP and you only, you forget how to spell. You forget simple things is right and you can't sign things. Our, our Montessori school does a really great job of that balance of technology, innovation and things. 
there are examples of how to do that right. You have to know that if a scholar just gets into that space, they lose a lot of other skills. We, want, we don't want to pick up innovation and lose our foundation of instruction as well. So I think in an innovation, you have to be balanced. The scholars are going to tell you, I can't sit in front of that Chromebook all day. That is struggling. That is impacting their mental health. So as long as we're doing innovation, it has to be something you touch and move to apply. I think that will be the key to me. You touch it and you apply it. I think that is what we have to balance. We don't want the scholars sitting and being so innovative that they forget the natural things. Uh, if you look at school districts across the world, like a Japan district, they start off with so much teaching about the scholar just being a well-behaved, how to interact with people, how to do various things. It's, it's other skills we can't forget if we, you know, face that new frontier that's going to happen. That is not going away. Whether we want to or not, that innovation is going to happen. Now, we can try to ignore it and we'll get our scholars behind, or we can embrace it, balance it, give them tools for it, and, and, and hit the horizon together with the scholar. That is something we definitely have to do with the scholar. Any final question? From sure. You had mentioned, I think, in your first interview and today about the smaller class size. Yeah. Could you expand on that a little bit more, on, on your thoughts and your philosophy of, of where, you're, where you think education should be headed? Yeah. I don't think this one will get me in trouble with the union, so I'll <laughs> go for it. Uh, definitely when you, I, I want to say something that, I talked about it as well, that we have a population that are scattered in our country right now, right? In larger cities, they're getting bust out of those spaces, and I've watched that happen, right? And these scholars are coming in with no tools, right? And so if we are not preparing ourselves for that, we're going to continue to get caught behind. The reason I say class size is because when you really support that teacher through innovative scheduling, that is a skill that you get, you know, you've got to schedule the right way. The interventions are embedded in the, what you're doing. It's subtle things. We have a great, robust system. I walked in that school and saw scholars presenting, doing hands-on things. I was excited about that. The only thing you have to do is provide that space for those touch points inside of that class. You can't do those touch points with classes over 18. And you got classes with 24 kids, and half of those scholars are diverse learners. That is setting the teacher up for, for failure, setting the classroom up for failure. We're going to see the same subset of scholars continue to move, but we're not going to see our diverse learner population get those touch points. That is why that innovative hiring is important. You've got to build that system of scholars and people in place so we can look at how our, in that new innovative space, any innovative spaces that working, you can't have those large class sizes. We've got to rotate out the inter interventions in that class. We've got to support our, our teachers. And one of the things, you can't ask a teacher to take on both. They're either going to take on the curriculum or they're going to take on the be behavior management and culture. You better take one off as a district. And my skill set right off the bat, we're not dealing with behavior management and none of that. We are going to make sure we hold care. We're going to care for you, but we're going to hold you accountable. And that's worked in every place I've been. Because I don't make the rules, we make the expectations together, and we remind each other about them. And there's a cost that goes along with expectations versus rules. So I'm taking that off the table. I'm not allowing the in in inequity as being in a classroom where a scholar can interrupt the learning environment for the rest of the scholars because we did not come to school for that. And I know that's a tough conversation. But we're going to make sure we show care before accountability and we're going to make sure we support our teachers because I don't want our teachers stressed out. At the end of the year, if they feel like they're falling through the finish line, we didn't do a good job. At the end of the year, they're ready and rigorous and still excited about planning because what you do in August starts in May. And I need their minds to be still refreshed to be ready to go. And that's things that we have to do and we have to cater that and pulse that throughout the year. That is the reason I advocated for that class size. I know it, it, it impacts our, our budget and spending, but it's, it's, it's a realistic thing that we have to think about as we get more innovative with the scholars that we're getting in our districts. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I ask one really quick last question? Was uh, Joslin School uh, a year-round school? Uh, no. Okay. No. It was actually Anthony Davis School from the Lakers. It's his school. Perspectives Joslin School. Yep. May of 2019 to January of 2020. Yep. So okay. we had the highest graduation the rate. Summer break. Yeah. In between. Yeah. We, we had the highest graduation rate during COVID in any school in Chicago that year. We had one of the best test score increases during that year. Uh, that We in, implemented the labs. We had multiple labs because scholars weren't coming to schools. So we had a 
four different labs where they were doing photography, videos, and all these things. So we in, invigorated that space and had really good results at, at Jocelyn right. that year. But you were there from oh, May of 19, so that would have been the tail end of the... 2018 going into 2019. This is May of 19 to January of 2020. No, I was there that whole year. I think the transition was coming from a CERO to perspective. Okay. So a CERO is another charter that works with perspective. So I think that is what, I, I don't see the resume in front of me, so I'm not yeah, sure what you're looking at. I'm sorry, I, there, this bit, like the second time, maybe the third, that your, your resume is apparently incorrect. I mean, there are th I, and I'm not saying you're not being truthful, I'm saying yeah. what we're looking at and what you're saying are different. Yeah, so I, I think, think what we you're, need some clarity on that. I think you're missing a CERO is what's throwing the resume uh, okay. off. Okay. So but I'm not it's sure. That's all we've got. Okay. Okay. And I did send him the resume that was updated uh, right before, but I think he had already put the one in. And when I asked him, could we make sure that we had the one that was reflective on my LinkedIn, he said it was too late to do that. I think that's why you okay. are missing the one that has okay. a zero on. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, appreciate your presentation. I've enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. And uh, really appreciate you applying for the job and look forward to the further discussion. Appreciate you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. So let's take a break until 730 and then we'll restart. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Whichever you're more comfortable with. So welcome, Ms. Miller-Nelson. Um, consistent with the letter that we sent you, yeah. about approximately 30 minutes of presentation about your vision for MPS, and then Q&A with the board. Um, I'm sure some of us have some prearranged questions, but a lot of conversation it was what happened in the last one. So. Great. Um, We'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to come back and talk with you again. And I have done just what the prompt indicated, and so I'm excited to get started. Day in the district was, uh, as always, a joy-filled day. Uh, it was interesting to visit the schools that I visited, Siebert and Jefferson and Dow High. And I chose to take a slightly different approach, knowing that I'm out in schools quite a bit and I'm familiar with our facilities, with our staff, with our students. I still was really seeking opportunities to connect with our staff, but I paused first and I reflected on our vision statement. And I thought, you know, I really wanna get a sense of where I think we are in our journey toward this vision statement and collect some artifacts and living examples of our journey toward our vision statement. So that's what I have for you today as, we, um, as I share information about our day in the district. I do not have photos of students. These are simply artifacts that I uh, saw out in classrooms, hallways, and in our schools. These three in particular struck me. They um, are from my visit to Siebert. And I need to tell you first, uh, classroom visits at Siebert were remarkable. And if you want to get cheers and claps and smiles, you need to go into classrooms with either Paul Schroll and or Courthouse Clyde. 
Courthouse Clyde, uh, the service dog, went with us and it, it made it all the better. These are great examples of the kind of messaging that we send to our students. And in particular, the one on the top, moving from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset is a powerful message and it certainly aligns with our primary years program overarching philosophy. The one to the side, let's discuss, I think is a particularly interesting visual for us, a particularly in interesting artifact, because it says that we're teaching our youngest learners to engage in respectful dialogue and discussion to make meaning of what they're hearing from others. It's a really special opportunity when we know that students can have that sophistication of conversation, and these sentence starters are amazing opportunities for them to learn that skill. Lots of student work uh, plastered across the walls at Seabert, which is such a celebration of our students and our staff, creating a culture of reading and literacy. Uh, you should see the students' eyes light up when uh, Mr. Schroll gives them a book. And so that was extra special that day as well. Another great example of what we are uh, instilling in our young people the idea that we want them to be thoughtful, to take action, to reflect, again, really illustrates our primary years program. This was something I had not seen before in my previous classroom visits. One of our uh, early elementary classrooms, they were using these affirmation coin sheets, writing things like, I am kind, I am a good friend, I am a good listener, and uh, planning to use that throughout the week in their classroom. Of course, this was, uh, we want our students to learn, grow, and blossom. This is from Dow High. Lots of positive messaging at Dow High in ways that really show our values. We see students leading with respect, trust, and courage. We're seeing collaboration and inclusion and a sense of belonging. We certainly have award-winning uh, teams and individual students. This is just one example of the trophy cases that I know are at both of our high schools. I just happen to be at Dow High for my day in the district. And of course, uh, I'm clicking too fast, but we really value our legacy and our history, and that was very clear as we ventured down toward the athletic wing of that building. Artwork everywhere, these are panels over at uh, Central Auditorium, which was the second half of my day. Again, such an opportunity for our students with our fantastic art program. This, this might have been a highlight. Uh, students have taken the time to be reflective about what they know they need as learners and to honor our teachers by recognizing that in them. And they have pasted these, taped these various signs outside of teachers' doors at Dow High. It's pretty special. Diverse artwork displayed throughout because we know that diversity is a strength. Many examples of how we're honoring the diversity of our students and celebrating that through visual representation. And I just couldn't help but have this be the last photo. This was in a classroom at Siebert. We can do hard things. Moving on to, uh, I should pause quickly and just offer I, th I think this picture might have been on social media. When I first got to Dow High, uh, two amazing students served as my tour guide, which was an extra special uh, twist to that day. We started down the hallway, and the choir was there to sing two beautiful songs to me. Uh, they did a fabulous job welcoming me and interacting with students during uh, the lunch period. Uh, some really wonderful conversations where they shared all the things they love about Dow High and Midland Public Schools their entire journey. So the day really was very uplifting, thinking about where we are, again, in alignment with our vision statement, and I'm really proud of how we're progressing in that space. Reflections on our Midland community. Uh, you all know you live here. It is an amazing place. And yesterday, I was fortunate to attend the mayor's State of the City address and was reminded again what a terrific place we have. Together, Forward Bold, an exceptional place where everyone thrives, and it is a special community because of our people and our places, the amazing resources we have, so many community agencies and philanthropic partners who really care about kids and care about our school and really wrap around to provide that support. 
We're a community that values connection and placemaking, and we have this tremendous spirit of innovation, of caring, of boldness, and of achievement. So as I reflected, of course, on our community, I reflected on our own personal, our, our district vision statement, my own personal leadership style, and again, our, um, our vision statement. I really started to think about my leadership style a bit more, moving into what my personal vision uh, for Midland Public Schools would be. And we didn't really touch on this in the first interview, so I wanted to share with you that my style squarely falls in that framework of transformational leadership. I believe I am in service to others. I really care about building a culture that empowers and inspires, and that we have trust and care and connection. I want you to know clearly that I'm future focused, and I am certainly not afraid of change. It's part of what it means to embrace a continuous improvement mindset, and I look forward to leading us forward into big important changes. That happens because we do things together, and that's a core principle of mine, that we don't do things to people, we do them with people. And I think I made a joke of that in my first interview that my curriculum team, uh, they hear that from me often. And uh, part of why we do that is because we know when we gather a group, we can really leverage the assets that we have. We do a lot of really wonderful things here, and when we can build on those strengths and assets, be open-minded about what's in front of us, we really can create our future together. So it's with that sort of trio, our community vision, our district vision, my own leadership style, that I've landed on this as my personal vision for leading Midland Public Schools, uh, hopefully as the next superintendent. I will serve, lead, inspire, and create the conditions for student success through a caring, inclusive, and trusting culture. And I wanna unpack that a bit for you in our conversation tonight. I stop short of providing abundant details, a, a, a roadmap or a strategy, because I really do want you to leave here tonight understanding that I believe in collaboration and co-creation with all of you as board members and certainly uh, with our teachers and our overall team. So my, my uh, overview for you tonight is to just share three areas where I believe we can create the conditions for success. And I'm sharing with you some ideas I have about these areas, but again, really want you to know that I look forward to fleshing out the details of these together with our team. The first area is exceptional student success. If we really want to move from being excellent to being exceptional, we need to focus on student success. And three ways we can do that is through well-being, achievement, and a systems approach. For each slide, I'll just pick one bullet to discuss. I listed others just so you know that I've really been thinking about what this work could look like. And while I have specific ideas of these areas, the real nuance and details of them, again, require teachers and principals and our team to come together. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is important for student success, but it's also personally important to me because it's the right human work to do. And uh, you may know that I've been part of the development of our DEI strategy since the beginning when Mr. Shero asked me to begin leading that work all the way back from when Leanne Keller-Rouse was our external consultant to our executive on loan all the way uh, to Joy uh, Yang Chow, who is our uh, DEI director right now. I've worked closely with uh, Mr. Hogan for our equity strategy, our equity audit, and the early phase of our equity strategy. And I look forward to getting us back to the deeper parts of that. We have done some amazing things, as you've seen in the communique these last couple of weeks, around celebrations and events, which is one part of our strategy. I feel really good that we have very inclusive activities that help our families and our students feel a deep sense of belonging. We need to continue that, and now we need to press into some of those um, deeper areas of equity through enhancing our tiered system of support by looking at our systems and structures and ensuring that we really are attending to the needs of each individual student regardless of their circumstances. I'll just make a note quick at the bottom, the active engagement part. I really look forward to opportunities for us to expand 
some of the experiences we provide students. I want every student to have a meaningful connection to their school through a course, a club, a sport, a community activity. I want them to explore their passions and their career interests. And we really need to do a better job of providing opportunities in all of those career pathways, starting in uh, elementary for exploration, a little bit deeper exploration in middle school, and then some preparation in high school. We have a good showing in the skilled trades area, but there are many other career pathways that uh, we could use some additional experiences. Student achievement is you know, really why we're here. We must have high expert expertise teaching in every classroom every day for maximum learning. It is abundantly clear in the research that teachers are the most important factor within the school walls when it comes to student learning. So any investment, care, and support we give to teachers is a care, investment, and support in students. You've already learned uh, at Monday night's board meeting about our professional learning communities work, so I won't reiterate that. We've learned a bit about our literacy leadership network as well, and that coaching model that we have now in our secondary schools and have intentions of expanding in our elementary schools is really that job embedded piece that supports the professional learning communities and the additional uh, leadership work. I look forward to bringing forward to the board soon through our staff development proposal process, some additional professional learning opportunities specific to elementary literacy that will really bolster uh, teachers' capacity to deepen the implementation of our curriculum and the uh, essential literacy practices through workshop models and um, some, again, job embedded coaching next year. Systems are probably the least exciting part for us to talk about, although I find them to be absolutely foundational. If we are going to create the conditions for our teachers and our students to be successful, we really must embrace a systems approach. And this means that we have a continuous improvement mindset, that we are willing to evaluate programs and practices. Everything we do deserves that critical lens of what, what was it intended to do for students and are we getting those outcomes? And if not, we really need to be thoughtful about tweaks that we need to make or modifications or potentially strategic abandonment to free up our resources, our time, and our energy for new ideas. I'll just touch quickly, uh, multi-tiered system of supports. You've, we've talked about that in the past, um, particularly in our curriculum team. And this is a gateway to equity. This is, if we can really uh, enhance our system uh, the way we need to, it is the way that we see each individual student understand their current circumstances, understand their current needs, and identify their individualized path forward. But I want to be clear that the core, that foundation piece of a tiered system of support is high quality, effective teaching every day in every classroom for every student. Exceptional culture is uh, my second area. This one, uh, with your permission, we will cruise through rather quickly because our last engagement, we already spoke about community and connection and communication. So I'll just hit a high point here, uh, knowing that this was some feedback I received from you all, which I very much appreciated. We absolutely can do more to connect with our business uh, partnerships. I have some experience in that from my years in CTE. Every CTE program has an advisory committee made up of business and industry, parent representatives, and post-secondary partners. So that is not unfamiliar to me, and I look forward to uh, advancing that work for us in a more holistic way as a district. I actually used to attend uh, the Chamber of Commerce Business Education Partnership Council meetings, and uh, I'm sure they'll be willing to partner with us in new new ways to advance that. I also want to just note that parent and family engagement is something we have done a good job of, but could certainly do better. We've made some advancements this year, and I want to be clear that these kind of engagements aren't just about getting families to us so that we can tell them things. It's really about getting families to us so we can tell them things and then they can tell us some things. It's reciprocal learning. There's a lot that we can learn 
from parents about their child and how we can, again, help create some of those conditions in our classroom and schools that will work for them. Communications we've talked about, uh, we just need to keep on this loop of asking what works, continuing to identify ways to communicate with people, to go to them, and building that reciprocal structure because that's how we increase trust is when we can be counted on to communicate in clear, authentic, timely, and transparent ways. Collective ownership is my uh, third piece within that culture bucket. And I wanna be clear, you might think, oh, this feels a little bit like your system slide. Systems and structures over here, collective ownership, collective efficacy, our belief in our ability to make a difference for students. This is a feeling. When we can really have a shared sense of our purpose and goals, understand our vision and be united in that, and organize ourselves in those ways too. So I don't wanna downplay the systems, but this is where we really move into that space of collective ownership. We do things together, together we make a positive impact. And collective efficacy, the literature shows that it is one of the highest effect size practices that moves a school uh, toward greater achievement. With this also does come that idea, however, that we continue to be data informed and that we're monitoring, supporting, and evaluating. Our third component is exceptional organizational leadership. These are four pieces of finance, facilities, and human resources that uh, really do matter, given that we are a large school district and, uh, as I had said before, an important employer in our community. Excuse me there. For finances, we absolutely must continue to maximize and equitably allocate our resources to ensure optimal outcomes. We need to leverage our existing effective systems and processes. And I really want to just spend a minute here to say the fact that we continue to have very clean audits is evidence that we have effective systems and processes in finance. Where we can have a bit of a growth edge is continuing to press that those decisions we make about how we spend our money are very student-centered. And again, that we place this lens of equity. How can we spend our dollars in ways where we know certain students need a little more support? I think our summer school programming is a great example of that. We've chosen to provide very robust and extensive summer learning experiences to students at quite a dollar because they're students who are not yet proficient and need that additional time learning and growing. We do not, at this time, choose to offer summer programming for extension. Students who are already proficient don't have that opportunity. We know our community provides lots of other opportunities for them. That is just one small example of what it means to think about how we spend our money through that lens of equity. Of course, we want to balance immediate needs and future sustainability. We've done a very good job of that historically and need to continue strategically using our grant and our bond dollars and where we have the opportunity to partner with our community uh, philanthropic agencies. We have been the beneficiary of some really amazing um, projects that we've done in partnership with our local foundations. It's been a while since we've done that and I know uh, there's always interest in supporting Midland Public Schools. We must also continue to monitor, evaluate, and make the tough decisions about how we spend our money. An example of that is, um, which we've talked about before, is our current program evaluation process with our ESSER and 11T dollars, and what we've decided we will continue uh, with general funds and other grants. Those are some tough decisions because those are about people and programs and, of course, about our students. Facilities, I have a feeling we're gonna talk a lot about facilities in our future. Uh, we, of course we want exceptional facilities to match our exceptional programming and our exceptional students. Safe, secure, appropriate, modern learning environments is essential and we know this extensive planning process that we've already gone through and what we still had ahead, have ahead of us and this next phase of absolute uh, clarity with our community getting lots of input about the options that we have on the table and ensuring again that we're making very student-centered decisions 
in what that after we uh, synthesize the feedback from the community and land on a final plan and uh, we heard Monday night of course that we continue to uh, invest money in our capital improvements line items so that we can do those projects throughout the year outside of those bond dollars Man, I'm just a little happy here with the sorry about that uh, human resources is our third area absolutely we need a more comprehensive strategy we have a great human resources team they're doing uh, everything they can in the moment but we need to really sit down and develop a comprehensive strategy to attract retain uh, recruit retain support diverse high quality teams and this of course is teachers but this is also administrators it's bus drivers it's paraprofessionals it's everyone who is part of our Midland Public Schools team. We can do better in expanding our partnerships with colleges and universities. We have some really a solid foundation to that, but we need to take that to the next level and really start to look at some of those non-traditional pathways to teaching and see how we can connect with them early on. We need to promote our profession. Part of this is uh, the work that we've already started with our Future Teachers of Tomorrow program here in our high schools. I'm proud to say that class will run in the fall. We also have a CTE program focused on future teachers here in our consortium. Starting to talk about the, the beauty of our profession early on though. Uh, elementary students start to form their thinking about who they are and what careers they see as possible for them. We really need to start having some conversations early on so that folks know that this is a really joyful and wonderful career. I'll just hit on one other here in terms of, the, that was more in the recruitment space, in terms of the retention space, focusing on wellness, belonging, and engagement with our community. Uh, we have started some work in this space of shifting our culture of care. Now we need to have some more deliberate actions around uh, creating that sense of wellness for our teachers. It comes from within, but it also comes from us as an employer. And I look forward again to hearing what our teachers and staff think would be good for them and doing that work together. We have lots of community opportunities, the Wellbeing Coalition, we have a fabulous Midland, Greater Midland Community Center, lots of agencies and organizations, and uh, I'm proud to say uh, Brian and I recently made a connection, and Jeff too, with My Michigan Health. They are doing some really great work uh, in this well-being space for their employees and have agreed to talk with us about some of the strategies that we're using. I'd love to bring those back and see what our teachers think. And compensation matters, we all know that, and celebrations. We can do better in celebrating our amazing staff, both in person and using social media platforms to really rave about the awesome things that are, are happening in our schools and the great staff we have. Governance and leadership is the last area. <clears throat> Excuse me. These first two bullets are really about us as a leadership team, the board and the superintendent, ensuring that we have essential working agreements we ask our elementary students to create these of how they want to work together and, and treat one another. And I, I think it would be a great modeling experience for us to do that as well. And with that comes clarity about communication structures as well. Understanding that we are uh, collaborative in our learning and planning. And I think there is some learning that we can engage in together to help us understand where we're headed and what's next to reach our highest aspirations. The bottom three bullets are really about leadership of our organization overall and the work that we do with our full uh, admin team and our staff here at central office and beyond wanting to foster this professional team oriented service minded environment we talk about that lot a lot here in central office that our job is to support what's happening out in buildings and in classrooms in the spirit of time, I'm just going to stick to this last slide and say that again, I really look forward to creating the conditions for student success with all of you and with our team. I really wholeheartedly believe in co-creation and collaboration and know that when we bring our teams together to design our future, it's going to be a beautiful thing. Thank you very much. How am, I, how am I on time? You are two minutes ahead of schedule, so perfect. <laughs> Terrific. Um, 
Penny, you probably expect this question, but I'm going to hit hit you head on with okay. one. Given your history and relationships within MPS, how do you most effectively create the case for change and lead this team if you're selected to the next level? Actually, thanks for asking that. I, part of why I asked how I was on time because um, the letter that you provided after the first interview was really helpful. The feedback helped me know that you see some of my strengths and it also helped me see where maybe I didn't share enough information about my knowledge and skill and experience for you to have full confidence in me. So this question about big change, that was one of the pieces of feedback. So if I could, I'd like to start by just sharing a couple examples of how I've led that and then I think that will give you a window into how I function and what that might look in the future. So yes, um, we have, I have led some big changes for us in Midland Public Schools in my time here. You might remember our STEM strategic plan was multifaceted. It included elementary work and secondary curriculum work. And that secondary part was my sole responsibility to lead. So implementing uh, the plan, which meant creating the courses, partnering with Project Lead the Way, implementing those, training teachers, the whole, the whole gamut was under my leadership. And while you might think that's a small slice, at the time it was one of the bigger curriculum efforts that we had revised across the district and it required procurement of materials and resources, it required uh, strong financial planning, and of course lots of teacher training. Another example which I already gave is our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work and it's hard to even wrap your head around what that actually looks like. It's ongoing, but that equity audit and the initial development of the strategy and implementing those pieces, I would consider some of the biggest change that we have done and will continue to do into the future. The best example of that, and then I'll stop with examples and get into your question. Once the decision was made to move to remote learning during COVID, I held the responsibility and accountability for developing our remote learning plan. And I'm not sure there's been as extensive or as rapid of a change as that moment in our schools, our district's history, maybe our state. Uh, Mike and Brian and Jeff all had their areas of, of responsibility and influence and certainly provided feedback along the way. I, I gathered our curriculum team principals, teacher leaders, and in a very short turnaround created an extensive plan that not only moved us to remote learning, uh, moved us in the direction of a learning management system, instructional technology tools that would enhance learning in those remote and hybrid situations. We revamped aspects of our curriculum very quickly. We created a multi-layered plan that addressed the well-being and safety of our students as well as keeping their learning moving forward. I think our data show that how we've rebounded since the pandemic, that we actually did a really good job keeping students as engaged as we could within um, those parameters. It absolutely was a team effort, but that was under my leadership and under some pretty interesting conditions. So I want to assure you that I'm prepared to lead big change. We have some models in place of how we've brought together teams to do that. And uh, of course you learn, you learn from your mistakes too. So this is why I continue to talk so much about co-creation and collaboration. And that is my model moving forward. It is to be very clear about what we're after, what are the outcomes we're intending to get with whatever the change is, digging into the research around that and really understanding what those evidence-based practices might be that we're seeking to implement applying that to our local context because evidence-based practices might work in one location but we have unique aspects about us so there is a process where you really need to be thoughtful about your local context developing a clear implementation plan using implementation science where we again understand all of the aspects what what the intended outcomes are how we're going to progress monitor across the way to make sure that we're implementing with fidelity, lots of checks with all of the folks involved, and then of course measuring to ensure we're getting outcomes. All of that again happens in this collaborative co-creation space. Great. Thank you. Uh, 
Penny, you mentioned ESSER in your initial presentation, and just to circle back on that in the debate surrounding it, uh, with the sunset of ESSER, how have you led the district through decision-making processes on what initiatives will continue? <clears throat> this might sound a little repetitive because it is that same process I just mentioned although maybe not quite as extensive. So we were very clear from the start, which is something I'm particularly proud of, as we made decisions initially about how to spend our ESSER and other supplemental grants, that this money wasn't forever. The things that we were choosing to do may or may not be sustained depending on their effectiveness and available funds. So that clarity up front was really important to me and to our entire team. We, again, collaborated. I can uh, actually remember in great detail the session we had at Central Auditorium upstairs in that second uh, floor large meeting room where principals brought their <coughs> teams together, their MyKIP, their continuous improvement teams, and lots of other folks. And we looked at the data, and they made recommendations. And then we vetted that through our process. We came back here to central office and uh, along with our grant team uh, mapped out what we could afford to do and what we knew would get us outcomes or what we anticipated would get us outcomes. We've monitored all along. Uh, Kim Funnel, our grant specialist, picked up that monitoring piece for me. She met with principal teams monthly for quick check-ins to make sure that we were still implementing with uh, integrity and if there were uh, course corrections that needed to be made, we would do that along the way. And lots of other things that provided support in implementation. But now we find ourselves at the sunset of these. And we, because we were monitoring, we had a good sense of what was working and what wasn't. But we implemented a more formal process. And rather than do an extensive program evaluation, we created a, a slightly sh shorter tool, but it did ask principals and others who were responsible for these activities to gather data, to reflect on the entire process and what went well. If we didn't get the outcomes that we intended to get, why? Was it an implementation issue? Was it, uh, you know, where was the misstep along the way? And then at the end was sort of the final reflection of, do you want this to continue? Is there enough evidence to say it's working or that we're on the cusp of it working? And how would you position this in a priority way with the other activities? We met just recently with that principal team and had those conversations, got some additional input from them, came back and filtered that through available funds. And the one thing I will not take credit for is that part, um, Brian and Kim, and Lori Holderby and John McClelland did an amazing job looking at all of those details, mapping out what was possible so that then we could make some decisions about what's, what will continue and what won't. That was a lot of detail, probably more than you wanted. <laughs> Give me the look next Thank time. <laughs> Penny, I think one question that I have received a lot of feedback from the community um, asking me to ask is, you have been at MPS for 16 plus years. How do you identify the areas that we need to change? Because you know the district so well and it's all, it's comfortable. It is. So how do you really yeah. pull out those areas where we can do better? I've thought a lot about that since again, receiving the letter with the feedback where one of those points was sort of the dilemma of the internal candidate. and. Um, I see that. I see um, where it could be perceived that I might just be really comfortable and because I do believe we are such a phenomenal district that I might think we're status is good. And, and we're not. Um, we have some amazing, amazing things happening. We certainly have terrific teachers and support staff working really hard. But there are pockets where we must do better. So looking at our data, if we just want to go directly there to look at our achievement data, our growth and achievement data, there are lots of opportunities to celebrate. Our 11th graders in math and ELA uh, have very high student growth percentiles. We have 76, I think, and 77% respectively in ELA and math who have average to high growth celebrations across the board. However, uh, you know for sure that we have some work to do in elementary literacy. The fact that we are above the state average is something to be proud of, but it's not 
our greatest point of pride. 48% of our third graders are proficient. We can do better, we must do better. So I'm not immune to, um, to those areas where we need some real intensity and focus. And elementary literacy, third grade literacy is one of those. Uh, we have some issues in sixth grade where it might be a point of transition, but we have some growth that needs to happen there as well. So I, I can see that. I can see that in the data for sure. Um, I think I recognized early in my interim space that we had some shifts to make with our culture as well. That was clear to me and took action in that way too. So I think those are two examples where I can see it. I feel it and I can see it. And I like to surround myself also with people who are critical in the best way and are not afraid to point out those things that maybe I can't see. And I've been thinking a lot, uh, should I, I be fortunate enough to uh, serve as superintendent? We have an opportunity to hire a curriculum, associate superintendent of curriculum, and if that happens to be internally, that leaves a vacancy somewhere else. And every time we have a spot, well, I love, I love uh, finding internal candidates to take those leadership roles. There are moments in time where bringing in external people as part of your team is what's necessary to just really put a spotlight on those areas. Um, I loved one of your pictures in particular called the, We Can Do Hard Things. Yeah. What is the hardest thing that you'll have to do at, in your first year as superintendent? Well, hard has some different context, right? So a couple things come to mind. And um, I guess I'll give one that feels a little more um, administrative and then maybe one that feels a, a little more personal. Uh, our future work in facilities is going to be hard. It's going to require a lot of listening, a lot of time and energy and effort, a lot of bringing people together to hear diverse perspectives about those two scenarios that we've put out there into space uh, there and in our December board meeting. And uh, I say hard, I think it will be enjoyable and fun, but there will be a hardness to it because those were some big ideas. And I have a sense that we will have some community members who will be uh, deeply in support and some who won't and building that uh, consensus around an idea that we as a community can really rally behind is is going to be challenging but I look forward to it the um, a second hard thing that might be coming in the next year or so uh, and I'll just I'll just put this on the table you know we have negotiations headed our way in the near future uh, some of the legislative changes that have happened have, have changed the dynamic of aspects of our contract I believe uh, we have a great relationship with our association. Uh, we have contract review as a monthly engagement where we maintain good relationships. Uh, their president and I meet regularly to really stay connected, to understand what's happening, to problem solve, and to sort of look out into the horizon. But that doesn't mean those are always going to be easy. You know, if I had a magic wand and a truck full of money, I would love to pay people all of it, right? But there is this balance we need to find within our, our finances so that we can maintain that stability moving forward. And there are other aspects of that contract that we're really going to have to, to grapple with. And I believe we can do that if we stay aligned with, again, our shared vision of, of leading with respect, trust, and courage, keeping students centered in our decisions and knowing that we really do have mutual interest in caring for our teachers and our staff. Where do you think some of our blind spots are as a district? Oh, that's a good one. So one of them is what I mentioned before. I think we are really great at pointing out all of our academic strengths and when and this is a, a maybe a blind spot of our entire state right when you use averages uh, it makes things look really really good and we are good but the fact that we still have students who are not growing 
at the rate we want them to grow and are not proficient at the levels we want them to be proficient, I think sometimes we can, um, as a system, as a community, the way we talk about ourselves, I think that can be a little bit of a blind spot for us. And so I, I want us to just bring that into the light and own it and then take the steps that we've been taking uh, with many of the, the strategies that I've been sharing with you over this past year to really advance us in that area. I also think uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is an area that we really need to advance and dig in. I, the celebrations and images that I shared with you are lovely and wonderful. I think they promote a strong sense of inclusion and belonging. If we're really going to get into the space of talking about equity, uh, there, there are some frank things we need to do. We need to really look at our curriculum. We need to make sure that every student who is in our school can see themselves in their curriculum. I really love that windows and mirrors analogy. Every student should be able to see themselves as though it's a mirror and then have a window into the life of someone else that maybe they're not familiar with and they don't interact with often. So really deepening our work with that and moving beyond just what feels good and looks like the visual imagery of that is um, maybe one of our blind spots. Yeah. Penny, I have a <clears throat> question. Uh, we know that progressing the facilities, facilities plan in the future bond initiative is extremely important to MPS. Uh, what assets do you bring to that process and what do you think are going to be the keys to success? Yeah, so I was really fortunate to be here in 2015 with our, our last bond. And although not specifically involved, I watched that process as a learner to understand what it, it takes to do the work up front and all of those community connections. Uh, I will not profess to you to be an expert in bonds, right? Like we, ha we have experts that do that work for us as do most districts. What I do know that I bring to the table is my connections in the community and the relationships that I have, those that I continue to work to establish to uh, promote a trusting relationship with, with not only myself, but Midland Public Schools. And I believe I will be well positioned to go into our community to not only help us understand what that facility plan needs to look like and bring that feedback uh, together for us, once we have a plan, being able to communicate that with clarity and transparency and excitement and enthusiasm so that our voters get excited and understand what our aspirations are for our community. It's a team approach for sure. And I think those of you who've been on the board a while know that no one person really does that in isolation. It requires our business office who we hire to be experts. It requires our facility department who we hire to be experts. Uh, and it requires our agenda team, our executive team, to really keep a pulse on that and to make the decisions that lead us forward. That's probably not an omen that the light turns off. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's that energy performance bond. I love it. Yes. Motion sensors. Right there. Did I answer the fullness of your question? You Was did, there another Penny, part? You. Okay. Yes. I have a question. So one of the things um, that through this process and, um, and your interim that has um, kind of come into um, view is the need to um, get student voices yeah. and hear what students are talking about. And you've started that new um, initiative. Um, you had a day in the district where you had, yeah. um, had high schoolers that were able to ask you questions. Um, through either your superintendent group with students or the day in the district, what is something that a student or students brought forward that you see as an area that we could take action in? I'm so glad you asked that because I don't feel that I've had an opportunity to talk enough about students with you. Uh, in the first interview, I talked a lot about culture and uh, you know how much I love and value our teachers and our staff. And this one, maybe I focused a bit more certainly on student success, but by creating the conditions. And um, I love interacting with our students. It's why I'm here. The Superintendent Student Advisory Committee has been an absolute highlight. Just today, our team was out doing uh, literacy walkthroughs over at Central Park and got to interact with students. They are not shy to tell you all the things. Uh, <laughs> so I probably have a list of things. Um, but specifically from our, our student advisory team, 
we are hearing uh, some, we've, we've covered one topic specifically right now, which was around well-being. And um, there is some clarity about their concern with the academic pressure that we place on students. And we actually spent a little more time in that space than I thought we would because I was trying to understand if they feel it's the adults, the parents, or their peers, and really it's all. It's, uh, and, and society maybe as that fourth piece. We're not quite sure what to do about that. We spent so much time just letting them talk about how they feel about it, what they're experiencing. Uh, when we meet next month, we're gonna move more into that solution seeking space with them and see what ideas they have. But that is something I'm very interested to do with them because it imp directly impacts their, their well-being, their mental health. And I want students to continue to opt to take classes that challenge them in appropriate ways, but also allow them to have a balanced life. They can play a sport, they can work if they wanna work. They can be in clubs and community events. So finding this balance is, is something I'm very interested in. Penny, have you ever applied as a superintendent elsewhere? No, I have not. Okay. Um, it's kind of uncommon for a district of our size for your predecessor had three very highly qualified people underneath him as associate superintendents. Do you think it's, it's more common for them to encourage them to pursue a superintendent position? Um, it's very common, that segue, for them to be encouraged. Do you think you would encourage your associate superintendents to become superintendents? I, I believe part of my leadership responsibility is to build capacity in all of our leaders and to help them find their pathway to wherever it is they want to be. I hope any one of our principals or our current associate superintendents chooses to continue advancing their leadership pathway. Uh, it's not my place to share Brian or Jeff's personal journey or story or aspirations, but certainly if that's something they chose to do, I would wholeheartedly support them in that endeavor. Okay. Am I answering your question? I'm not quite sure exactly what you want, wanted to know. Yeah, you are. Okay. Yep. Um, is this your dream job? Yeah. I have no intentions of going anywhere else. Uh, you asked if I applied mm -hmm. anywhere else. I have not. I have no intentions to do that. My hope is to retire from Midland Public Schools as the superintendent. Okay. You led me to it. So Go ahead. When's that going to be? <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair question. Um, you know, I believe I have at least a decade in me. Um, I intend to, my work is what brings me joy. It's my purpose in life. I certainly love my family and enjoy them as well, but this is what I'm meant to do. I'm an educator at heart. And, um, and there is really something special about this place. I have, I, I have no intention of leaving. Okay. Um, I have lots of experience of working with you in curriculum. Yeah. Um, but not so much on the finance or business office experience. I know that's not your direct responsibility. What, ha what experience do you have of working with the finance group and the business office? Sure. When I first came to Midland Public as a CTE coordinator, mm -hmm. I immediately became responsible for our CTE budget. And I know that's a small portion of our um, million plus dollar budget but at the time it was pretty significant and complex for me again at the time because it was not only general fund dollars but lots of other CTE grants our, our vocational money uh, Perkins funds from our ESA so that was my first venture into understanding how we function and what it means to really develop and manage a budget uh, and that just continued to grow over time as associate superintendent, uh, quite an extensive budget out of that office. As you know, 
from our staff development proposal meeting. We're looking at half a million dollars potentially just in staff development proposals, and that's just one portion of that budget. We're actually uh, in the budget development phase right now, and I'm still doing the curriculum office budget, because that's still my responsibility. And uh, I feel very comfortable in that. All the state and federal programs and grants were under my purview, millions and millions of dollars that I have experience in managing just as that associate superintendent. Now, of course, you acknowledge we have a phenomenal business office, uh, of course, with Brian leading that. We have very clear systems and processes and procedures in place. I say that our, our audit is the best evidence that those processes and procedures work, so I don't see a need to change those. I'm just pushing in to better understand them, to help um, navigate some of those decisions that come about, Brian and I sat together, uh, Jeff looped into that as well as we were really looking at that final grant plan to understand the things we wanted to continue, where we knew we had additional resources through some grants that will continue on like 31A and 31N. Um, I, I feel comfortable. It's an area where I continue to learn. Actually in my coursework at Michigan State right now, the class I'm enrolled in is school finance. So uh, that's a bit of a larger picture of school finance as a country. We're zoning in a bit more to understand adequacy versus equity, what that looks like in Michigan historically over time, how we can apply that to our local context. I think that learning combined with the strong system that we already have here, we're gonna be fine. Okay, you mentioned you think you still have a decade so uh, you're questioning that <laughs> no not at all <laughs> okay okay if you were successful in becoming the new superintendent give us a vision of where we are in five years and where we are in ten years absolutely uh, student growth and achievement on the trajectory up we need to see some really significant gains uh, in five years and I believe we can do that Several of our areas were already uh, rebounded nicely from 2019, and our, our trend line is in the right direction. There are a few areas we're not, and so intensifying that work, much of what I've already talked with you about is what we need to continue. So in five years, I see us having uh, stronger academics and stronger growth. I see us uh, in our new bond uh, phase building all the things that we want to build, renovating the things we want to renovate, uh, ensuring that we have safe, secure, uh, awesome facilities that are flexible and modern to meet the next phase uh, that's coming. One of the things we've talked about in uh, some of our facility discussions is leaving some space that's flexible for future programming. I really want us to be thoughtful about the career and tech ed experiences we provide. There are some areas, some career pathways that we've not yet tapped into the way we should. I'd like to see us advance in that work um, and really just get good at the fundamentals that we know we need to be good at. And okay. have a great culture, of course, because you know, that's the foundation of it all. And what about in that? Um, <coughs> could you touch on where we are going to be in five years with our CTE? Yeah. Uh, I think that's part of the co-creation. Okay. I think we need to have a balance of understanding what our students are interested in. We need to look at workforce data to understand where the emerging and future career opportunities are. I'd love to see us do some refresh with our facilities in some of those areas. Uh, you know, we have a welding teacher who's very passionate about his program. We have students who are very interested. We've made some good upgrades, but that facility isn't yet exactly where we want it to be. Uh, similarly with our building trades and woodworking area, I think there's some room for improvement there. I'd like to see us do more in the healthcare area. We have a healthcare tech partnership that's phenomenal. It's taught out of a pretty typical classroom. We can do better than that and we haven't even looked at some of those other career pathways yet. So as we think about career in tech ed and we think about facilities, I think those need to be paired up. And helping students identify um, not only their area of passion, but potentially future career options. Middle school too. Okay, I'll stop. But middle school, we have some things to do in middle school. Does anybody have one final question? 
Principal, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Delightful. Thank you so much. So let's take a break until, what do you think, 10 minutes or five minutes? Oh. 835. 8.35. 8.35. Seven minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, right. Okay, I'll forego the hand. All right, so now to deliberate, um, I'll ask people to take a minute to reflect. Um, you know, we're, we're reaching the end of a fairly long process. Um, we have had first round interviews, a day in the district, and now second round interviews, as well as should mention I really appreciate how much our community staff and students have been involved in the process and we've gotten comprehensive feedback through the HYA portal as well as through our board email account so um, take a step back take all of that into consideration and then I think we should rather organically talk through the pros and cons of both candidates as we work towards making a decision. So, <clears throat> so anybody want to volunteer to start? Sure. I will. Sure. Um, I really wanted to like Dr. Reed. I mean, I, 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 there's a lot to like about him. He's a very dynamic individual. Um, he is. I think he's the kind of person who will embrace, I mean, not to only embrace change, but lead change, <clears throat> change. excuse me. <clears throat> but as I've said before uh, at our earlier meetings, he's moved around a lot. And typically, my observation has been, typically there are two reasons for somebody, somebody changing jobs that frequently. One is they truly are a rock star, and they just keep getting bigger and better opportunities. Or the other possibility is they come into a new setting and because they are big thinkers, they have big ideas, which may be, you know, may be worthy, may not, but they try to do too much too fast. Uh, they don't work within the system. Uh, and after a short period of time, they find that they don't have the support because they haven't built the, the rapport with the stakeholders uh, and they've upset the apple cart and then they move on. I don't know which Dr. Reed is. I, I uh, And frankly, I'm not sure I want to find out. Um, we asked him tonight uh, to clarify some things and, and I think we're, we're left with as many questions about his work history and experience. Um, is when we started uh, at the beginning of the evening. So I really wanted him to clarify some of those things for us. Um, uh, and he just, he didn't, uh, in my view. Um, on the other hand, um, as, as I think we've all acknowledged, we know very well what we have with Penny. Uh, we have had a year to observe her in the interim role. Um, and I think tonight she addressed uh, all of the concerns that that we brought to that you know that we asked her about and she acknowledged there are there are because of her own experience and her own work uh, history there are things that she you know uh, I guess referred to as blind spots mm -hmm. um, that she's embracing and and you know willing to take on and, and she's got a, a team around her that she's willing to to draw on for the expertise that she may not have so um, you know I think tonight was uh, was helpful uh, in, in crystallizing for me that uh, that uh, Penny is the uh, is the choice that I'm going to vote for. For those reasons, I appreciate all those reasons, uh, John, and I, I agree with with all of them. Um, and I'm going to just f build on on Penny, um, and just to point out the 10 years um, is phenomenal in superintendent years because the national average is actually three to six. So for her to get up and say. You know, I think I've got a decade to do this is a lot 
Um, and I know I was pretty critical of Mike Shura when he said that, and now having realized how much is actually done in 10 years, uh, 10 years is a long time for a superintendent. So I think we would be very lucky um, to have our next superintendent around for 10 years. I also appreciated that Penny um, kind of went out of her way to address all of the issues that we presented to her um, as part of the follow-up letter and to, to talk about those specific points. Um, she also has done a lot of initiatives that she's taken on herself, um, helping form the DEI, uh, being in charge of the remote learning, um, leading the, the discussion and decisions on, on what to do with the um, ESSER programs, uh, just to name a few. Um, her, her blind spots were great. I like that she acknowledged that the DEI portion that we really need to get into um, the equity portion of, of DEI uh, throughout the district. Um, she was very responsive to student voices. Uh, she's got experience with bonding, but she knows that uh, we have experts that do that, that do that. And, and I think she's very much a team player. Uh, conversely, I, I think Dr. Reed is, is also a, a team player, but I felt like a lot of the questions that I asked him, uh, you know, he said he did everything. And he may have rubber stamped a lot of stuff, but I didn't get the sense that he actually initiated a lot of the programming that he talked about. Um, it simply came across his desk uh, being an equity, um, the chief DEI officer. I think that's his, what he said his title was, um, not the chief of schools. So I agree. I, I will 100% um, uh, support Penny as our next superintendent. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I'd like just to kind of bring into the conversation, um, we mentioned we got a lot of feedback from our community mm -hmm. um, and lots of feedback for Penny and some really great comments in regards to why someone like Dr. Reed would fill a need for a lot of our families and, and our community and talking about, you know, maybe the students who are in the middle or the students who don't feel like they belong and having a different kind of representation um, is important. And I think it's really important to acknowledge those comments um, and also to say that I don't necessarily think that Dr. Reed is the fit for Midland Public Schools um, and that Acknowledging that those comments are there gives us a better idea of what our blind spots truly are when people are brave enough to come and send an email or f go to a meet and greet and share that with us. Um, so really making sure that we're carrying the learning from our community feedback and this process and listening to, you know, an extremely engaging um, person like Dr. Reed that has different philosophies that are exciting um, to some of our staff and some of our families and some of our administrators and and just w approaching with curiosity how we can carry that excitement through um, if Penny is the choice tonight. I want to step back and take a look at why we started this whole search process. I think it was about a year ago, uh, Brad, you called the question in regards to a search committee uh, because we didn't necessarily want to have uh, Mike's replacement given to us. Uh, and I think that was where the genesis came from. So we stepped back, we went to the search committee, uh, came up with the options, and we ultimately ended up picking HYA. Uh, if we're sitting here a year later uh, looking to give the job to Penny, and I think Penny did a very good job as the interim. But if we're sitting here a year later, after having looked at a lot of resumes, what have we, what was the effort for? If we're sitting here a year later saying, well, we're looking to give her the job. So I guess from that standpoint, I want to make sure that we're being true to the reason that we went out and looked and engaged a search firm to, you know, conduct a national search. Uh, from my standpoint, I think Dr. Reed hits on a lot of the issues that, and a lot of concerns that I have for our district. Uh, and in terms of, I think we've got a really unique opportunity to really start addressing equity uh, in the correct sense. So, let me 
pull at that thread just a yeah, little yeah. bit on the HYA because yeah. I think yeah. it's an important point. Um, and thank you for bringing it up. I think when you have a district with 7,500 students and the size of the staff that we have, shame on us if we're not building superintendents of the future. And I think Brad's question to Penny tonight kind of addressed that, that we should always be thinking about our principals and associate superintendents as growing into a role such that they can be a superintendent in a, in, in a district. So what did we do this effort for? We did this effort to make sure that we had the right candidate and the right profile of a person that can lead the district in the vision that we have formed as a board. If that so happens to be the internal candidate, I think it's important that we have gone through this process to ensure to ourselves that the internal candidate happens to be the best candidate. Um, so I think it, it is important to do this process as we look out through a national search to make sure that we have cast a net wide enough to review all of the available applicants. Um, it's also not lost on me that COVID turned over 60 to 70 percent of the superintendents in the state and nationally. There are not many people with experience either at the superintendent level or the associate superintendent level available that want to work anymore. So the pool may just be smaller, but it was important to do that search to make sure that we had all of the candidates available, whether they were internal or external. So, uh, looked at either Ann or Brad, do you guys want to go next? Go ahead. So this, this process has been interesting and I think it's been a little bit of a, a Internally, for me, it's been a bit of a roller coaster um, because we hired HYA, and I, I really wanted to see what they could bring to us and what they had to offer. Um, and like I said a couple meetings ago, I think we got some really great candidates. It, I, I, I. trying to find the right word. I respect Dr. Reed immensely, and I love his equity lens. Um, however, I have some concerns about his attention to detail and his understanding of importance the importance of building strong relationships, kind of what John Lauterbach said, before you make big change. Um, I have concerns about Penny as well, um, that there are some blind spots after having been here for 16 years. Um, I think she's very comfortable with all aspects of MPS. And it does scare me to choose the internal candidate after a year-long nationwide search, right? Because if she was the best candidate in front of, sitting in front of us the whole time, why didn't we recognize that? Why didn't we know that? Um, but I also think that one of Penny's greatest strengths is that she knows she has weaknesses. And I think that she is constantly on the hunt for them. And I do think that over the past eight months, she has grown, and I think she is growing more confident, and I think she is ready to address some of those weaknesses and some of those blind spots. So while I'm still not, I don't love the idea that we did a nationwide search and that we very well may be choosing the internal candidate, 
at the end of the day right now, I believe that she is the best candidate for MPS at this time. I know two meetings ago we said we would love to see Dr. Reed after he's been superintendent somewhere else. And I think that still stands true. Um, I would love to see some external candidates brought in underneath Penny to bring some new ideas um, into the school district and help her identify her blind spots and her weaknesses a little bit better as well. Brad? <clears throat> I have similar thoughts uh, to with many of you um, and some differing. I made the motion to make uh, for us to go through this process and to hire this firm because it's our job, plain and simple. It's our due diligence to do a nationwide search, spend the money, do exactly what we did, and take a year to do it. That is what we are elected to do. Um, I have not made it a secret. I think I've said it probably four times. I was disappointed that we didn't get a non-traditional candidate. I was hoping to see a non-traditional candidate. We didn't. We Everyone came through the education pathway. Um, I don't think that, I don't, I don't think that we should be scared of somebody that is onward and upward and, and latching on and bringing that person here. Um, I think Dr. Reed has a lot of great qualities. I said it before, I think he's, I think he's a star. I think he's going to continue to be a star. Um, I also have some concerns about Penny, and I had made that known at our last meeting. Um, we have a lot of challenges in front of us. Um, we as a board, and the whole public knows this, that upon completion of this search, we are shifting gears and we're gonna be talking about a bond and where the people wanna go with that bond. That bond is gonna range anywhere from 200 to $300 million. And I'm not 100% confident that Penny has the tool set to do this $300 million bond, but I think working with her more over the past year in this capacity, I have a little bit more confidence in that. When, if you were to ask me that the day that she started, I would have been very apprehensive. I'm not saying that she can't do it, it's gonna be challenging for whomever we pick. I don't know if Dr. Reed could even fathom what that's gonna be like when we, of all of the rooms we're gonna to have to get in and all the people we're gonna to have to meet with and get their feel, get their opinion of where are we headed as middle public schools with these facilities. He wasn't wrong when he walked in and he said, ooh, I got to change that. That is not what a young scholar should see when they walk into their school. So I think he is a big idea guy. I don't know if he really would be here for his three-year-old for that whole duration, I don't know the answer to that. That's a long time. I don't know if any of us are gonna be, you know, about our futures of that, that long, but I wouldn't be scared to go after that franchise player, that Peyton Manning, that type of person. It does not scare me at all. Um, I 
but I'm not totally convinced that he is our future, but I think he's got some amazing qualities, and I think he's going to do a great job. If it's not here, it will be somewhere. Um, I like both our candidates, and I think they are dynamic differences, huge differences. Um, went back today, and this is, I don't know, 28 pages or whatever. This is one of the documents that HYA gave to us after they had surveyed students, the board, and then, is it teachers or a it was staff? Staff. It was staff. Yeah. Thank you. And they did a profile on all of the qualities that each of those three groups wants. And I think that all of the shortcomings that we are trying to make up for that we weren't so successful with with our last superintendent that I think she has identified a lot of those and I think she's attacking a lot of those, of, of our shortfalls that are in here, of, of the person that we, our public, our students, and our board want to see as our, as our superintendent. One of those is someone who's approachable. All three groups said that. Open-minded, trustworthy, transparent, someone we can trust, financial background. There's a lot in here for us that we had to study and to really see what's the candidate look like? Who is that candidate? We did our search. We knew what everybody wanted. We boiled it down to the two. Um, I think it was a long process. I do share a lot of the same concerns as everybody here. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges that Penny is going to have is taking us from excellent to exemplary when you've already been here for 16 years is tough. That's really, really tough. And I have big concern for her because she is a great person and very caring and has a huge heart and she has put herself in all those classrooms and all those trips throughout this past eight months. But I think it's going to be really tough for her to go from excellent to exemplary because there's going to be some pains in there. And that's a tough road. Um, I still have thoughts both ways. I'm not going to say who I'm voting, voting for. I have a lot of concerns going both directions. But I think we have two pretty outstanding candidates that we've been talking to. And I'm not scared of either one. Thanks, Brad. Um, a lot of my fellow board members have said a lot of what's on my mind. I would add a couple things. To me, details matter. Um, Resume and background matter, and giving me specifics matters. And I think that the way in which the two candidates prepared for this interview were starkly different. Uh, it was obvious that Penny had read the feedback that we provided as a board um, and addressed those issues. She seems like she's very open to constructive criticism and feedback and takes it to heart what we say. Um, a superintendent in this district is only as successful with, is only successful with partnership with the seven of us, whether they're from the outside, whether they're from the inside. So I share some of your concerns about creating the case for change. That was what, my first question. We addressed that in her feedback after the first interview. 
I think she provided some very good examples of where she has led change in our district. Um, as I look at where we need to go, I think Penny is the ideal candidate for our district. I think through our feedback that we have received, particularly from staff, they trust her. And I will challenge our staff right now that if she is our candidate, you have to support her in making the changes that we collectively identify together, that we've identified in our profile, district profile, as well as what we work on <clears throat> in these board meetings. So with that, I would support Penny. I think we're at item 3.2. Would anybody like to make a motion? I will. Uh, based on everything we know and what we've learned to this point, I would like to move this board to present Penny Miller Nelson with a conditional offer of employment for the role of superintendent, Midland Public Schools. Support. Motion by McFarland. Support by Lauterbach. Any further discussion or questions? All in favor of, uh, should we, should we do a roll call? We can do a roll call. That's fine. Ask for a roll call? We no, we can do it at any time. So, uh, Mr. Hatfield, can you take roll on the motion to present Ms. Penny, Penny Miller Nelson with a provisional offer to be the superintendent of Midland Public Schools? President Roush? Yes. Vice President McFarland? Yes. Secretary Hatfield is no. Treasurer Lauterbach? Yes. Member Blazy? No. Member Ringold? Yes. Member Horwitz? Yes. All right. The ayes have it. Okay. Um, couple things just to mention. One of the things that we have to do as a board every year is rate our superintendent. That includes an interim superintendent. I purposely I made an executive decision not to bring that forward until we were done with this process um, because I didn't want it to affect the process. So as we move forward, we have to do that by law by the end of the school year. Okay. So I will work with Penny to to set it up for either April or May, and, and I'm, I'm guessing probably May at this point. Um, but I will work, uh, I'll let each of you know. As you think about the process that we've just gone through, one of the things that I think we should really take a long, hard look at as a board is that feedback that we were provided through the district profile report, as well as even thinking back to the first round interviews, I. I thought Mr. Malley presented us with some good ideas. Dr. Reed has presented us with good ideas. Both of those candidates, we should think about their feedback for us as a district and how we make our district better. So as we move through that process, please think about the feedback that we should incorporate in her performance evaluation and help to build uh, her success moving forward. Um, with the move tonight, you've empowered me to negotiate the contract in accordance with what we had set out early on in this process. Um, and we will come back uh, at our regularly scheduled April meeting to present that contract to the board. Any further questions or comments? Thanks for leading us through this. Are we going to use the probably the same? structured form that we have used in the past yeah because that's part of the part state of law yeah. yep that yes okay. the the one through four rank, ranking yeah. yes mm -hmm. yeah. so i don't know if there was more than one that was approved i'll double check but i think it's just the one okay. that is approved if you could, yeah if you could double check that i'd appreciate that okay Thank so you. when we were talking about the compensation for the incoming superintendent we had and i'm gonna get the number wrong but we had indicated that 
we might provide certain metrics or negotiate certain metrics by which the superintendent could make additional compensation, will that be part of you? Yes. So how do you set the, who sets those metrics? Um, I think what you do, what my thought process was, because we have a ranking scale that is provided to us by the state of Michigan for effective and highly effective, not effective, and I don't remember what the, the last one was, um, I think in particular we think about how you utilize that form as well as specific data that we've identified as a district, whether it's student proficiency, student growth. Um, but if you have other thoughts, I'm, I'm open to feedback on how we do the, the variable part of compensation. Can we find models of districts that do that too, so we know what it looks like? It's a good question. I'll ask HYA. Um, I know when we first pulled the compensation data for other districts, we showed it showed of some of that. So, and in the state of Michigan, you can call pull the contract itself. So, mm -hmm. we can do that as well. I think we can also discuss. I'll ask Thrun as well because it'll help to draft the actual contract. Any further questions? Or do I have a motion to adjourn? Support. All in favor, say aye. 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 Stand adjourned. <laughs>